Hey everyone, welcome. Let's see if we have everyone. Um, I'm trying to figure out. Sorry, I was delayed a minute. I couldn't get in for some reason, but if we have all our committee members. Heather, I also got into another meeting that wasn't this one. So perhaps the Zoom configuration got changed. So we'll keep an eye on who's Oh, here. okay. No, I didn't end up in the wrong one, but okay, that's good to know. Um, I'm just trying to figure out now if we have all of our committee members. You know what I'm gonna ask? We haven't kicked off yet, but typically for school committee member, for school committee meetings, we do ask that committee members or those who've been invited to speak, keep their video on. And those who are observing, turn your video off for now. We will have a place for public comments and certainly invite you to turn it on and make a comment. Um, but otherwise we can't tell if we're all here. <laughs> Right. Thanks, Heather. Thanks, yeah, Heather. sure. Oh, that's great. Thank you, guys. That's really helpful. I hate to ask people to turn videos off, but um, unfortunately, that's very helpful. Okay, so now I can. So I see five of us from Concord. I don't see our Carlisle members yet. Well, I know that. Uh, I'm, here. I'm here. Sarah's oh, here, sure. but I'm driving, so I'm going to keep my video off Got until it. I get. Okay, until I get good to know. To Thank you, Sarah. Okay. Okay. Hello. Hey, Ava. Can you uh, change your name? I got it. Or the name on your screen. Let's put it that way. Can yeah, I can't change it. Unfortunately, I can't change it on my phone. Okay. Oh, there it is. I'm oh, not sure how to do that. Setting. Someone changed it for you. Thank you. Okay, so we have everyone now. Yep. Well, are you good if I open up? Let it rip. All right, well, welcome everyone. I'm gonna call the Concord School Committee meeting to order. I'll note that we are being recorded and broadcast on Zoom, obviously. We're also being broadcast on the education channel <laughs> of Minuteman Network for anybody um, who's interested and wants to watch there. Go ahead, Wally, I'll let you open also. Um, yes, uh, bring the Concord Carlisle's Regional School Committee meeting to order. And let's do a roll call um, for attendance vote. Here. Rainey. Here. Booth. Here. Mustafi. Here. Wilson. Here. And I'll uh, note that Alexa Anderson is here, and I think I saw Fatima. Um, Fatima, what, we could put Fatima up on video, that would be, uh, that'd be great. That's great if it works out. And for anyone who doesn't know, Fatima is our, oh, there you are. Hi, Fatima, welcome. Thanks for joining us. Um, she is our newly elected member who has not been able to be seated yet and won't be able to until we have town meeting, but it's good to have you join us. Fatima will take my seat after town meeting. Exactly. Um, great to have you join us so you can follow what's going on. Okay. So then I'm going to jump back and forth between um, agenda here. Wally, do you want to kick us off? Do we have comment? Comments are first, right? Yeah. Um, for today. Um, public comments. So public comments, if anybody has a public comment, you can raise your hand with the button below and we will look for any here. I don't see any. I don't see any. So I think we can move to uh, okay. correspondence. Moving right along to correspondence. Um, we've gotten quite a bit of correspondence in the past few days. Yes, um, in the past day even. Uh, well, I'm hoping, actually I meant to coordinate earlier, I'm hoping you did the count of, of CC. I have 105. I, that's about what I had. I, roughly earlier, but hadn't double checked again right before we came on. That was for the high school. And then at CPS, we've had, um, let's see, two more emails regarding anti-racism, one regarding the um, calendar suggestion about Columbus Day versus Indigenous Peoples Day, and 12 regarding a personnel issue, um, plus 
actually one more that was related to back to school that was CPS specific only. Uh, the rest were region or, or joint. Okay, and the 105 emails we had from the high school were mostly all students uh, talking about uh, the current plan, which is to come back alphabetically. Uh, vast majority of those were seniors. The vast majority of those were opposed to that plan, as you might expect. Of course, everybody would like to be able to come to school with their friends, but uh, we certainly have considered that model and um, we will keep keep looking at options, uh, but don't wanna hold on any false hope that that alphabetical approach is gonna change. <laughs> so uh, moving on to... Uh, well, next chairs and liaisons reports. Yep. Um, I will skip over chairs in the uh, light of just moving on to other things. Were there liaison reports though from other groups or subcommittees? Not from me for now. Okay, thank you. Court, I know you set up a policy meeting, right? And you've started to plan for a policy meeting with an agenda? Thank you, yes. Uh, the policy subcommittee, it represents both Concord and Concord Carlisle will have its first meeting since February. Uh, it's slated for this Thursday, uh, 4 p.m. And the agenda is uh, twofold. One, to uh, orient new members toward the work ahead for the year, which is a typical sort of uh, housekeeping meeting uh, that we would do at the beginning. And secondly, to begin to sort out uh, priorities because they have changed uh, somewhat. Uh, as you can well imagine, we have uh, uh, the Massachusetts Association of School Committees and other contributors suggesting COVID-related uh, changes to certain policies. So we'll be uh, selecting which ones we try to bring forward quickly to the larger committee. And then following that meeting, uh, we plan to set another one, no date set yet, where we can ask the superintendent and our, uh, our council from Massachusetts Association of School Committees to come in and provide some technical guidance. Uh, that meeting should produce some recommendations to the uh, two committees by way of uh, COVID-related policies that are either wise or perhaps even very necessary uh, in the very near future. Great, thank you. Thanks for setting that up, Court. It's important. Um, other liaison reports. So Heather, I just dipped into the select board meeting, but Mike Lawson did announce that uh, Dr. Hunter would be joining them on next Monday, the 10th. I'm hoping that also two, one or one of the chairs or two chairs will be able to accompany her to that meeting. Yeah, that, that meeting was just set literally 20 minutes ago. So <laughs> I would like to ask someone to come along. That would be great. Yeah. Okay, great. We will figure that out offline and figure out who can join you. Yeah. Um, and of course, tomorrow night, uh, you'll be at the FinCom, Lori. And I know, Wally, you, you said yes. you plan to be there? I will be there. Okay, that's great. Or I'll be here watching them. All right. <laughs> uh, anybody else is welcome also, of course. Um, okay, let's see, any other liaison reports? Okay. It'd be hard to sneak a meeting in between the last one we had. <laughs> yeah, I know, exactly. You'd have to be fast. Um, okay. Um, I do want to just note something uh, uh, for anybody who might be on uh, waiting to hear some kind of a statement from the school committee about their reopening. That will come uh, during action items number seven on the agenda. 
during reports and action items, both probably. Yeah. Um, so uh, let's move on to the uh, superintendent's report. Yeah, I can't say I have all that much new to share since Thursday night. Um, we're continuing to work on the plans and the safety procedures and all that needs to go in place to um, come back. So we'll talk more on that when we get to that agenda item. Um, we did do the follow up on some of Thursday night's topics. So you'll hear that as well as we go through the agenda. And I think just point of note, we're gonna put the technology CPS discussion into the budget discussion. I don't think it'll be that long that we couldn't do it even if the patients of the Carlisle members, if that's okay. Okay. So let's move on to uh, reports for discussion. Um, Lori, do you wanna update us on anything with the reopening plan? You know, I, I think again, since Thursday, there's not a lot of updates. We do have an HVAC consultant on site today. Um, I've met with the commissioner again this afternoon. Uh, so we continue to hear updates from them. There are some discussions now at the state level as well, which I think we're all in agreement with setting some thresholds for what the data looks like as to when um, school would maybe not be open. So I think that's starting to have some discussion there, which I think we'd all be very glad for. Um, and I think we're in encouraging that discussion at a local level. So that's going to continue on. Um, we've been meeting with the staff. I was on with uh, parents and students this afternoon with Mr. Mastrullo and high school staff members and a really, uh, really productive, I think, conversation, sharing information, answering questions. Um, so that's the first of the series this week. We have the elementary meeting tomorrow at two and the middle school meetings are Wednesday and Thursday nights. Um, I forget parents first, I think, and attending as many staff meetings as I can and task forces and just supporting the building-based work that's going on. Uh, we're continuing the MOA discussions, so that'll be part of your work um, as we get a little further into August. Jared's back, so we're probably going to start talking numbers again today that uh, we can revisit where we're at with the budgets. Uh, I think overall we're just keep going on the path we've set and trying to make sure we're, we're following through as timely and as productively as possible. The bulk of my work tomorrow with the administrators will be to put a structure around the remote learning option for families. Um, I think it will be a scaffolding because I still have the quandary of if I don't know how many kids we have, if committing to a plan is, is a bit challenging, but um, I've heard the need for some outline of what we're considering. So uh, that'll be work over the next couple of days. Mm -hmm. And I guess final piece is uh, by the next, you know, again, on that same timeline, we'll be putting out the uh, question about waiving bus transportation so we can then build the routes with the known um, folks that'll be riding. So everything's moving forward um, as been outlined and we're on track, I think, for continuing to keep it moving. Great. Lots of work to do. Mm -hmm. Wally, Wally and Heather. Yeah. I wonder yes. if I might I wonder if I might get the floor for a couple of minutes right now rather than waiting for action items because I think what I've got something to share that I think is more suitable for discussion, not for the more precise uh, discussion and debate that'll lead to an actual vote. Would that be acceptable to you? Absolutely. Yep, fine by me. I think that's a good idea. Definitely. We, I, I'm going to speak for myself. Uh, but in speaking for myself, I'm going to uh, try to portray what I think I'm uh, hearing a sentiment from the school committee. And importantly, a sentiment from the staff and the faculty. 
I believe that we are really diligently, assertively listening to students and parents as we should. Um, I know for many years, uh, if I were to say students and teachers, I'd always put students first uh, because I thought that was the correct thing to do. That's really uh, the, the end all why we're here, but, but there is no here without caring for our teachers also. So I want for a moment to put our teachers in the front of the line with our kids and say that they're getting our attention as well. Uh, I went to the American Academy of Pediatrics site today and I went there because I know that they are a very, very influential advocate for reopening, reopening schools as fully as possible. And I don't disagree with that as a goal. But I would also add that we're going through this this anguish because we're dealing with a new virus. It's new, it's highly infectious, and it's got a rather high mortality rate. And that, that doesn't enter into our discussion in, in that bold way very often. We talk about many, many wants and more importantly needs for kids but we've got to protect a community as well. And so I'm, I'm aware that this committee is trying to strive for balance and this committee is trying to protect students and protect teachers. And I'd like to read something that again uh, is my, my message and you can tell me fellow members if it to some degree speaks for you. And I hope this informs in a helpful way the, the remainder of the meeting. The school committees are dedicated to the safe resumption of teaching and learning. The safety of teachers and staff are a main priority. They are responsible for delivering the educational plan and supporting the individual and collective well being of our students, whether in person or remote learning, is the educational mode. Our support for the current plans, as put forward by the superintendent of schools, is based on our best interpretation of the reputable scientific facts and conclusions available to date. We believe that the plans provide for a responsible balance between the goal of return to school for all students and the public health objectives we all must share. We endorse the work of the task force and we are indebted to the members who conducted this work that informed the plan that we call the roadmap. Further, we recognize that any plan must reflect current disease transmission data and other risk profiles for the community and the region. That data must inform decision-making so that disease levels in a community or in a school are identified promptly with responsible interventions to follow. Thus, the roadmap is a work in progress with infection level thresholds calling for those interventions, including school closings, to be added. Teachers and staff and administrators have been consistently wise and thoughtful contributors in the work thrust upon them five months ago, for which the school committee is deeply grateful. Students, parents, and the community at large have been supportive as we navigate the local response to the pandemic. For that, we extend our thanks. The coming weeks will be dedicated to refinement of the plans contained in the roadmap practice scenarios and evaluation, monitoring of relevant public health data, consideration of recommendations from state and federal agencies, work with our elected officials in Carlisle and Concord, coordination with our partners at METCO, facility assessments, hybrid and remote learning approaches and best practices, student scheduling, 
and many other aspects that address safety and educational objectives. Our teachers and staff are of paramount importance to effective learning by our students, thus obligating the school districts and the school committees to provide for the protections and protocols required for their safety. We will uphold this commitment to them and look forward to their continued engagement in the plans for a return to what will be a new form of teaching and learning. And I close. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Court. Um, I, uh, I think that certainly encompasses uh, a lot of my thinking about this. And, uh, you know, it's, this is a daunting responsibility right now across the district to, to do everything we can to get this right. Um, and uh, I know Dr. Hunter and her staff have been hard at this since, since March, if not sooner, when we knew there was something going on. Um, and uh, those of us on the committee, um, I can't remember a time in my serving on the committee that has been like this. Uh, I hope once we have COVID behind us that doesn't happen again for a long time. Um, but, uh, you know, those people that I have often said that uh, my experience with education is that it's really about the teacher and the student and only about the teacher and the student. And uh, that's guided me for six years. And, uh, and it's, you know, unfortunately right now there is a heightened and almost overriding importance on safety and well-being um, above all else uh, for those two groups. And, uh, you know, we only get to see briefly the, the relationship between those two groups and uh, the emotional bond that exists there as they work uh, through the educational process year in, year out. And uh, I think it's, it's paramount that we protect that um, and protect them. It's certainly been weighing on me as we go through this roadmap planning. Um, and we watch what's going on around the country. And uh, I certainly commit to be vigilant about gauging what's going on around here um, and doing my part as part of the committee to inform what we do. So, uh, recognizing that, you know, we have a, we have a part, I think it's a, you know, it's not a bit part of course, but um, we just have a part. And uh, I know there are a lot of folks on the, on this meeting today that uh, have been way more engaged in this than uh, any of us on the committee individually have. And I'm grateful to that. And uh, we, uh, we will keep doing everything we can over the month ahead of us to do the right thing come the beginning of school. I'll just say you guys said it well. I won't add on in much great length, but Court, thank you for putting that to paper. I wholeheartedly agree um, as well as with what Wally said. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Court. Um, I'm fully in agreement with, with everything that you said and thank you for saying it so 
wonderfully. We, we love our students and we love our teachers and we're gonna take care of them. And it's not gonna be easy. And we're gonna need their help. So Court, thank you for the statement. And uh, just to clarify for process tonight, if we have further questions or are we gonna have the discussion about reopening under the motion or we should, is this the appropriate time? I'm not really clear. So let's do that. We wanted to leave any room for comments on court's comment. Um, but if there are no more, I think the next step would be um, basically any discussion, further comments or questions that any of the members have regarding the roadmap. Um, and I'll just clarify first before we get into it. Um, keep in mind, we are not at this point debating which road within the roadmap we're taking, so to speak. We're not debating whether we're going into school with the hybrid and, and K-5 in person versus all remote, et cetera. What we're voting on tonight is the roadmap that presents our options. Um, and then the next step, you know, when we meet later will be to then uh, agree on which one we're shooting for as of September. But for tonight, okay. We're voting on the roadmap. That's not to say we can't discuss that at all. So comments and questions on what has been. Sorry, sorry to interrupt, but I thought that, that we had to submit the plan, the, what we were going to do by the 10th of August. We need to, you need to approve the plan in its entirety, which I think by default, you have to pick an intention, which is what I've brought to you. Okay. We all are very clear that whatever we submit on August 10th, if you vote it tonight, it'll be sooner than that. Okay. Is fluid because it has to be a, a plan that can, you know, the whole point of the plan is to be fluid and adapt and morph. Um, I think based on health data and any anything that would come up in terms of concerns about returning, there is not a set course, just like there won't be probably for most of this year. So the formal vote is that you've got the plan. Yes, I think there is an intention that you have to frame it with, but that doesn't mean that intention is in stone. That would not be realistic, so. So to, to clarify, I, I still need more clarification. August 3rd, we satisfy the State Department of Education with uh, uh, information about the three approaches that they wish to hear about. And all of the safety requirements and all the the rest of the document is also right. required. And August 10th, uh, presumably a follow-up that is more definitive about what our district will do across those three options. No, in fact, what they've already asked in the plan I had to give them on Friday, which we talked about last week, was what do you think you're going to do? Okay. So we've, we've shared the intention. What you're voting now is the completion of the plan that checked off every box of what they required for a thorough plan to include. And so you're saying, yes, we see a thorough plan in front of us. It looks comprehensive and you're supportive of uh, the, the way things are outlined and the safety measures taken and the approach to instruction. Well, with that- They, uh, they can't lock you into a, a firm right. commitment. August 3rd or 10th on something that's going to happen in September, um, okay. given everything. So not, not notwithstanding that latitude, um, I think we're going to need the best facilitation we can get from our chairs if they'll permit us to tear into this document for a few minutes. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, so I, I don't know what our process is for that as we segue that way. Well, let's do that. I think the, the goal of tonight is to bring up questions and comments. So it, I think, I mean, maybe we just go person by person, but, but it, Court, it sounds like you have a bunch of things you want to bring up. You uh, could start. I, I have bring a few, us through your yes, list. I, yes, I do. I have a few which, you know, may set the tone for a helpful conversation. Uh, I don't know. I hope so. Um, if you'll uh indulge me and we could go to page eight of the presentation uh titled hybrid and i don't know if we want to do screen share or just how you want to do that 
Um, I can. Uh, we could. I think I can do screen share. If somebody's more adept at it than I am. Feel free. But... As long, I'm happy to. I don't know that I'm more adept, but I'm also happy to. Are we both co-hosts now, Wally? Well, we need to be co-hosts. Um, I know that share screen is an option on my thing. I just don't know how to do it without showing everything on my screen. I'll take care of it. No problem. Okay. Thank you, Laurie. Yes, you're welcome. So what I've got is a, probably a couple of comments and a couple of questions and a couple of recommendations. If we look down at the, uh, the middle school and high school, um, I simply want to point out that the last uh, section on both middle school and high school students learning remotely may virtually access classes as they occur live for students present in person. Um, it's not going to be that cut and dry, is it, Dr. Hunter? Uh, we're still in um, discussion at the union level with me on exactly what it will look like. I think we're leaning towards a range of um, synchronous and asynchronous on those days when kids are at home. Some, I do believe, will be accessing, mm -hmm. some of the time I think they will be accessing live instruction, another time they'll be working independently. And much of that is about balancing a, a full day of not being on Zoom for six hours. Oh yeah, I, I don't disagree with that. I simply yeah. want our, our words to be uh, uh, what qualified a little bit uh, to uh, inform the public that uh, this is not uh, quite as simple as it, it appears here. Uh, page 12, if you'd be so kind. Sure. Um, I, all right. I was looking at what looked like PowerPoint slides earlier, Dr. Hunter. Oh, those must be my slides from the presentation. Yeah, which what that's what came up in my link to, from the agenda. Yeah, we've probably probably attached both at different points. Uh, Those are yeah. also very handy. So hold on. Yeah, and my purpose here is not to be controversial, but to hopefully clarify and if we can even still improve it at this late date, that might be. Yeah, that's the whole. That's yeah. the point. Absolutely. So number 12 here. Okay. That the one? Yeah, so um, my, my hope is, my recommendation is that uh, September 2020, uh, we're planning for an in-person opening and a remote opening uh, because that indeed is reality. Um, yes, it is. All right, and so let's just state it, um, that we're not going to call the remote learning experience secondary because we've learned a lot about how to do it and we're, mm -hmm. we're gonna be good at it. So I would hope that first bullet point could point that out, that we're planning for both um, because uh, that's, that's necessary. Um, okay, and uh, I simply want to point out to the committee that I think the, uh, the sub bullet uh, uh, under bullet three commitment, either quarterly, uh, Dr. Hunter has uh, appropriately qualified this to say that is a very necessary planning goal, but we're not going to beat up families if they have to uh, uh, make changes. Uh, yeah, in fact, I'm hoping the structure is so fluid, we yeah. can be really versatile there. So I want people to not overinterpret that word commitment yeah. uh, because uh, she's equally uh, clear about that uh, fluid uh, uh, necessity. Thank you. Okay. Um, the last bullet discussion, uh, discussion remain. Uh, we might want to wordsmith that as to remote learning model depending yeah. upon, and I think we know what that means. And that is that uh, just how remote learning gets uh, gets delivered, how it gets managed, uh, is going to be somewhat reflective of uh, the sheer number of students who are partaking. But there's many, many determinants 
correct. That's what we wanted yeah. them. Yeah. All right. Uh, page 13, next page. Uh, second to last bullet, illness protocols per Concord Board of Health. Uh, we do not have definitive uh, school or community or county thresholds for uh, positive tests or transmissions or numbers of cases in a building. Uh, so yeah, we're gonna be attentive to this, but if somebody asks us to share them in a, a really explicit way, I don't think we could do that right now, could we? Well, I think I'd clarify the, what the word protocol meant there. I think you're right about all those pieces that we're still in discussion on. The protocol there meant in terms of the process that would happen if there is an illness. So if someone is COVID positive, that is quite well defined at the Board of Health level right okay. now. So yeah. single case uh, we have in hand, two cases we have in hand, but uh, uh, metrics for decision making, no. Right. Correct. All right, thank you. Uh, can I, can I interrupt just because I have a question in this area, so I don't have to come back to it. Mm -hmm. uh, so when we say illness, this is of a student or teacher or staff member? Both, yeah. So what if, uh, people have been asking me, what if a family member of any of the, those you know, students, teachers, or staff test positive? Right. So, and this, this also refers to students, actually. We both would have the same process if they're COVID positive. Mm -hmm. um, the Board of Health has described it as out of the DPH and CDC guidelines. They do, we do not have to isolate contacts of contacts. So you have to have the firsthand exposure to be quarantined or isolated. If your family member had the exposure, you do not have to. That doesn't mean people haven't been more conservative. Some families certainly have, or some individuals certainly have. But per the protocol, it is not required that if, say for example, my daughter is exposed, she has to quarantine, but the entire family does not. No, I said test positive, Lori. Same, same thing. If the, if the, only the con, the primary contact. So if you are a teacher and your daughter tests positive, then yes, that teacher has to quarantine, but people secondary to that do not. So it's the primary exposure. Sorry, thank you, Court. No, I'm glad you brought no that up so we thank could you. clarify. And I'm sure we'll go over these again, and that's fine. I think we should. Yeah. Yep. Uh, yep. Page 20. So uh, I think we've heard uh, many a uh, uh, endorsement of the most uh, full-fledged uh, extracurricular set of opportunities we can, we can muster in athletics as well. Uh, but uh, we know there's a lot of unknowns. I've heard you say, Dr. Hunter, September 14th, we're gonna know more uh, from the state uh, folks, if I'm correct. Um, and so uh, can you speak to, just for a moment now, um, the, the extent of planning that's happening right now in regard to uh, what might be uh, modified, what might be uh, more creative than any of us would ever like. Sure. So Mr. Mistrullo and I, now that um, we're both in town, we'll be meeting with Mr. Jonkis as a starting point. Uh, we'll be looking at each of the sports and first starting with the phase three document that is what MIAA is using in terms of guidance. Mm -hmm. So some sports are allowed to compete, baseball, for example, although that's not a fall sport for us. So that is a, <laughs> not a great example, but it's an example. Um, and then look at the ones that don't have contact, look at the protocol for modified safe practices, and we're gonna have to go sport by sport and look at, see what the options um, could be. MIAA will determine the official season itself and the level of competition and those kinds of structures. So we have to stay attuned to what they're doing because even certain practices aren't allowed if um, they haven't called the season together. So we're gonna have to do all of that in concert with each other um, and under their regulation and allowance of what coaches are allowed to do. So more to come on that for uh, MIAA related pieces. We also would like to meet with advisors and bring them together for club, you know, club advisors and see what they um, maybe proposing. I know Mr. Mastrula would very much like to see the students involved in the club planning. 
um, based on, again, each club's gonna have a different set of parameters to work with. Some may be able to meet in person and, you know, small groups and distanced. Many will have to be remote. So we're gonna go club by club and um, start that work in the next week or so. So I wanna, I wanna pick up on what you said. Uh, uh, a, a club or an activity uh, might be able to meet in person, um, mm -hmm. which, which to me really uh, speaks to the the plea from so many students to be able to interact in some safe way with their friends. Um, my interpretation of the, the uh, alphabetical split is that we, in the final analysis, have a, uh, a simple choice at the high school, if anything simple these days, and that is that uh, students can get their uh, course load they want or they can see their entire class, but they can't do both. Um, and we opted for the educational plan with hopes that ideas like you just suggested could, could mitigate the, uh, the, the social sacrifices or accommodations they're going to have to make. Would that be accurate? Um, certainly the latter part would be accurate. I just want to clarify a bit on the choices we had between the alphabet and the grade levels coming in. If we bring the entire grade level in, most classes will not drop in class size the way we need to allow for the distancing. So then you naturally have to split them up, put half of the group in another part of the building where they can space appropriately. They automatically end up either remote or with a um, tutor or some other supervisory aspect. And then on the hybrid day, we don't have any classes available for them to zoom into. So very quickly instruction and education is impacted. Um, so that really was the driving force. It, yes, it might impact what's offered, but it also highly impacts the availability of in-person instruction and the effectiveness of the model we've planned. So that was the reason to not go that way. All right, thank you. And Cork, can I answer just because uh, I have a similar question? Um, it just let me ask you this question, and maybe um, it doesn't really seem like the opportunities to socialize in what they remember from February or that are going to really be available. And I think we need to make that clear that once they're at school, they're gonna be very constricted and restricted in their activities. Otherwise yes. we will yes. be shutting down school very quickly, I fear, yep. and that's not the goal. Um, I, think, I think we got a good start to that this afternoon when we had 300 students on with us and started to outline uh, the way the structures were going to work and um, outline the limited collaboration in the classroom, the lunch structure being so different. I, I do think we're uh, starting to share that with them and we will continue to, because you're right, it, it's not the same. No, and in fact, it's not even close to the same. That's what I'm right. saying. They, there's just, it's, it's, we really have to make it clear there's not going to be gathering and Right. Uh, so, you know, I guess we just make, and that's just one more question. What is the vision for how we can, during the free blocks, which were very unrestricted in the past, how will we enforce that? So we're still develop. Mr. Mastrulo is still developing that plan with the high school task force. Uh, we expect to have to name certain spaces in the building that will only be accessible There'll be supervision extensively in those spaces with distanced seating available. It's going to be much, much tighter and more structured and not the mm -hmm. collegiate feel that we kind of have enjoyed up until now, if you know what I mean by that. So um, we're getting all those, those uh, rules essentially in place so that we can roll them out to the kids. And I think that will help strengthen that there's really a solid plan in place to keep everybody safe. Mm -hmm. We're just trying to go back to normal, whatever that is. Right. Um, so, you know, I just think we need to have constant communication with especially the high school and, and middle school students about this because it's, um, I think it's going to be uh, shocking because I think everybody just wants to go back yeah. <laughs> to the way it was. Yeah. 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 Okay. We thank you. To message it. That is correct. So I know I know two high school uh, boys' brothers. One says, I want to go back because I want to see my friends. And the other said, I want to go remote because I want to see all my friends. Uh, literally. 
you know, one thinks he'll see everybody in his class remote, and the other thinks he's got to get back to uh, uh, more traditional interaction. And, and in a sense, they're both right. You know, uh, I, I understand the desire. Uh, last comment I have is uh, uh, one of the uh, very sensible uh, ideas that's come up in the last couple of days is that once more of the logistics for quote unquote new typical day at the high school or the middle school for that matter gets worked out that uh, a small selected group uh, runs through some kind of telescopic day or dry run to uh, uh, really do a feet on the ground experience to uh, further further test our plans. So, yes. Yes. Thank you for your indulgence. Um, and uh, Dr. Hunter, I think we're in good shape as long as everybody understands this is the uh, roadmap to A, satisfy DESI uh, and B, to present the options from which we're going to work with a lot of refinement uh, happening over the next month. Correct. And just to back up your point, I know the middle school today had their task force in, including students and did just that. They ran a day, mock day from the bus right on through. We need to capture that and share it. Um, we've got videos being made. So all of you are making really important points that um, the return to school is not going to be what we left and um, make sure that we're communicating that. Um, I've got a couple of things I'd like to mention. One, thank you, Cynthia, for, for bringing that to the forefront because, um, you know, I've been reading a lot of emails from seniors, especially. Uh, today I got to be so many that Dr. Hunter recommended we send a blanket response rather than <laughs> me trying to respond to every one of them, in which case I'd just about be getting here now. Um, the, uh, um, you know, the work we've been doing to get to where we are with the idea of a hybrid approach as much as we would like it to be about kids being able to see all their friends and can get back to quote unquote normal, it's not that. It's it's that we're able to get back to in-person learning. Um, and, you know, I think what will happen if we do that is that kids will actually make new friends. Um, along with the ones they already have, because they will be going to classes and they'll want to have that connection. And it's going to be right there and available to them. And I hope that if we do this, if we are in the buildings, that students can think of it that way. And because these are all your classmates, um, whether you know your name starts with S and all your friends are before L. Um, all those people that are after L are classmates of yours and you never know uh, where your next friend's coming from. So I hope that we can think about that, uh, whatever model we end up with. Um, and uh, the other thing I wanted to mention uh, it really goes back to, we're talking about sports and we we're talking about music on that slide. Um, I'd really, you know, we have a big contingent of students whose outlet during the year is theater. And uh, uh, obviously we're not putting on any plays, but I think there are things that we could do um, distanced uh, if we're getting together away from classes uh, that could give those students some opportunity to have some extracurricular activity too. So I hope that we can, I'd actually like to add it to the slide, uh, but I certainly hope that over the next month, we can be thinking about them uh, as well as sports and music and other clubs. Yeah, but definitely I'll add it to the slide. I, I know for a fact that uh, our talented Mrs. Uh, Church is working very hard actively working on those ideas. Great. So anybody else have comments on this? I think we've probably done a lot of what we would have done after a motion uh, later in the meeting, uh, which is good.
good, but uh, one hour we can wait until then. I, I do have a question uh, for Dr. Hunter. What uh, steps are we taking to address uh, students' uh, more individualized uh, needs, for, um, whether it's um, uh, more challenging classes maybe um, outside of the high school or uh, special education students? Are we making plans to make sure that uh, those students are brought in and they spend the most time possible um, on, on campus um, since equity is a big part of uh, uh, the conversation? Yes, so we are this week, uh, Ruth Gruby is meeting with the special education staff at each building. Um, she'll have a specific focus on that question exactly on um, the state in the in the guidelines we received is very clear that we should be looking at certain populations um, being considered for a full time program, despite the hybrid model. So we're going to be doing the work this coming week to determine who may be eligible for that. Um, I don't want to set a stage to have people think that will be a large, large number of students. Um, we're far more focused on for the majority that we would be actively providing effective direct instruction in and in service in the hybrid model for most kids but for um, kids with multiple services or in a program, one of our programs that um, keep intensive students supported, we are certainly considering that they may qualify for that full day. So that'll be a discussion this week. I think by the end of the week, we'll have a pretty good outline of what our um, plan is there. ELL students are also in that category, um, making sure that they're getting access to all the support that they need and where live instruction really does matter greatly. Uh, and, and a quick follow-up question. Uh, are we, are, is the high school, because uh, just talking about the region here, uh, there's truly just um, one option that we will be discussing and that's gonna be a hybrid depending on uh, the health situation of the, of, uh, Massachusetts and our um, uh, towns, uh, because the, we still have to provide um, uh, classes to all of the students um, uh, through um, whether synchronous or asynchronous uh, learning online. Uh, but for the students that are looking um, to uh, leverage and take classes outside of the high school while they are still part of the high school, is there is 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 this in discussions? Is is, is that uh, an option? So that's that's an, always an option that needs to be processed through the guidance department. Um, in some cases, it can be instead of our courses, that's probably the minority of the time. Other times it's additional courses that are certainly um, enrichment and you know certainly supportive of what a college may be looking for that to show that you've stretched. So we're the guidance department would be happy to work with people on what those options are. Um, and be sure people know before they sign on for anything. And for high school students, are we going to be using any outside um, uh, spaces in those un un um, uh, those um, unrestricted unrest uh, times um, to be supervised and maybe allow for some social distancing and um, uh, taking a break? Yeah, we're still looking at um, both the mask breaks, which will happen during the day um, as an outside piece. Um, we will have at least one tent. I think there's still discussion as to whether that's best used for lunch or other opportunities. So I know the building-based work is focused on that right now, but absolutely we are going to be maximizing the outdoors um, as long as the weather allows and maybe even pushing that limit a little bit into the later fall and early winter. Great. Hey, a quick, I have a K-5 question. Um, so because it's so important, usually after school is, I know not in our, um, not a big as concern, but for me, it is a huge concern so where do we stand with after school at K-5? 
Oh, uh, so I've been working with Concord Recreation. I met with them last week. They are building, actively building in a program at every elementary school from 1230, really 1230 to 3.30. And then people can opt into an extended um, day that goes all the way until six. So that is uh, pretty close to up and running for enrollment there about to hit the button, I think just pending uh, assuredness they can staff it, but that is absolutely the intent. I left the meeting we had on Friday afternoon feeling confident um, in their plans and in their ability to implement and execute. We are hearing just great success stories out of the programs they're running this summer and are of uh, great, great belief they will uh, mirror those again this fall. So. We're really close. We, we, we need to be, right? We, but we're really close to them turning that around. So when you get a basic idea of the tuition, and they're fairly confident they can provide the same level of tuition assistance that they're used to providing? Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. okay. Yeah, that's my understanding. Okay. And I have a question. How would they um, sort of, how would it all work with respect to the after, like the 3.30 or the 12.30 to 3.30 commitment and the K-5 level for coursework and classwork and yep. all of that. Would that yeah, be- Yeah, they, they already have named the remote learning part with an acronym that's CLASS, C-L-A-S. Don't ask me to remember what those stand for, but they already have named it. So it's going to be remote learning in a structured okay. afternoon. Um, they'll have a lunch <laughs> period first and then they're getting all geared up for that. So okay, cool. Yeah. So they don't want them to think it's going to be all fun and games when they get there. It'll be learning <laughs> fun and games. miss out. Just like school is. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. <laughs> and they're expecting, um, last Friday when we spoke, they were thinking of a capacity of 100 students per school. So that that's pretty good. I may ask a question. Um, uh, what about transportation for the after-school program? If we have a bus program limited, um, what is happening at three o'clock and what is happening at uh, second half of the after-school whenever that ends? So the program we're talking about will all be housed at the elementary schools to avoid the need for transportation. Um, Concord Rec and Children Concord Children's Center have both been involved in these discussions and know they aren't transporting. We aren't transporting kids to daycare settings after, after these get rolling. Um, so that actually has been a benefit also to us that we have more kids coming off of our buses and that pinch point. So, so that's all positive. I'll just mention this isn't a question as much as a comment um, because the question has come up many times about when we're going to give more details about the remote option. And I know you mentioned this, Lori, but just because we've had several emails about it, I want to reiterate that more information should be coming out the middle of this week. And so yep. Dr. Hunter will send that out um, and we'll all have more of a feel for what that remote option will look like. And I'm talking about for families who opt out of in-person if we're in person. Yes. Um, so. Like I said, it'll be a scaffold because to build the details is tricky without knowing how many kids it is. It is definitely a chicken and egg <laughs> problem, but some basics. Mm -hmm. um, Anybody else have questions about the uh, roadmap at this point? You have a good bit to get through prior to our FinCon meeting tomorrow night. So, uh, I take it after uh, a vote follows later tonight, Lori, you put a memo on top of this. You make a few changes based on our conversation, and off it goes to DESE, and uh, off it goes to the school website as a, an update to what was already there. Correct. Thank you. Okay. Well, I might just follow Court's comment before we turn to the budget and all of that. I, sure. I think uh, it's just so important. And I work with the teachers daily here, certainly all summer long and making these plans. And it's just so important that uh, we name that the safety of everyone is the priority. Um, that I 
feel the weight of every single day. I don't think when I became an administrator, I was an administrator for a very short window of months before Columbine happened. And once once you realize you're you're responsible for people's physical safety, which that wasn't the case years ago, it just is really overwhelming at times with what now schools are trying to really manage and um, truly take responsibility for. So it's just so important that, you know, the teachers here and that the community hears um, that that is by far one of our most glaring, glaring um, priorities. And hopefully the intent of how conservative we plan on being which I think was evident in March when we closed early, um, is still the case. Uh, we'll be watching the health data very carefully, continuing to consult with everyone around us, continuing to reach out to outside consultants. Um, and only if we're confident that we can avoid as many risks as possible, there's no guarantee. Um, but avoid as many risks as possible, will we keep down this path? Um, you got to do the work to be able to know that. So I just think it's important that we say that's the intention. And part of that is because you, you can't really explore that option without having done all the work to get there. That's how we ruled out the fact we can't bring all the kids back to the middle and high school. So I just think it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a path and it's one that going to keep having, my goodness, my day might have a step forward and two back in a given afternoon. And some days it's three forward and one back. And that will be the case, right? Not only if and when we open here, but while we're open. I don't think that work stops until we're a COVID free environment again. And we all know that's quite a ways out. So that safety commitment, I just felt the need. I think we've talked a lot on other things. And perhaps in my own head, I take it so for granted that they're, the, they're a priority. I need to say it more articulately. So, I, Court, I thank you for what you said and just want to be sure I back up everything that you voiced so so eloquently and just know that this is never far from our minds it's everyone's health and safety while we try to balance the educational needs of kids and what a really challenging place we're, we're in so um just felt the need to say it out loud so thank you thank you i think we appreciate that you take it that seriously <laughs> Okay, should we move on? I think so. And that would uh, bring us back to Jared uh, for uh, line item budget. Great. So I know we're having um, the workshop on Wednesday and I know we're gonna be diving deep into the lines. So uh, one thing I do have to report, it's actually pretty good news on July 30th, they announced that they are committing to at least a level fund, Chapter 70 um, uh, amounts per each district. In addition, there was about $107 million to, to uh, keep up with inflation. So what that did to my preliminary number, if you remember, I reduced my um, number by 200000 So this actually may increase that number, the new number, by 247,000. Um, I don't know what will happen in FY22, uh, but I feel strongly after talking to many of my colleagues that this number should hold, uh, and that's at least a good baseline going forward. So uh, that's just another thing that we can talk about. Um, they have not released any numbers yet for transportation and circuit breaker. Those are the other two numbers that I'm holding my breath on, uh, but this is a good start. Jared, do you want to clarify that's the region, correct? This is the region side, correct. This is strictly, that was the first thing on the agenda. So I started with the region, but this is all regional conversation. Um, other than that, I don't have any other updates, um, but I, I can take questions. Um, I know you, I sent that over to you last Monday. You probably digested it, may have some. Uh, if not, uh, Wednesday is good too. So, so I have a, again a new process question because Dr. Hunter is going to the FinCom tomorrow night to discuss this budget. I'm just concerned about delaying major questions until Wednesday, which I prefer to do. 
in the interest. So I'm trying to figure out when are we going to vote this budget formally? Yes, we are not planning on doing that yet. Um, so we will have to share with them the draft, which is not atypical from our normal processes in the fall where you would see it literally on Tuesday and they would see it on Thursday. Um, and both places are still in dialogue and neither is firmly set. So I think it's not as different as it maybe feels, although we do, you know, in another perfect world, the workshop would have come before the finance committee, but. Um, <laughs> yeah. So process wise, Cynthia, I would say we don't, to Lori's point, we don't need to address every single question tonight, but if you have a question that you want to bring up before we're discussing the draft with the FinCom, certainly bring that up now. Sure. So uh, just so the FinCom, I'm, I'm fine to wait till the workshop. If, if we were voting the budget tonight, then that'd be a different issue. Oh, right, right. If, if the FinCom can be very aware that we, uh, this isn't a final budget by any you know means, and this is just an opportunity for them to have a dialogue with the school committee and the superintendent. And we might have similar concerns to, to what they have. Um, mm -hmm. so I'm fine to defer to the workshop because that's really what it was there for. And I think that would be a better, because I do have a lot of questions, but they're, you know, just small things for the most part. And I could defer them. And just a reminder too, we also have to have a budget hearing in the next upcoming mm -hmm. weeks here sooner than later. So we'll um, need to put that on the books. You you won't vote until you've had that as well. So. Okay. Would, will we anticipate a uh, series of questions tomorrow from the FinCom that tries to, uh, tries to identify uh, COVID specific changes that we have made? Because much of the change that I see is uh, in the form of changes that you would have made anyway as new information became available about the normal program, the normal staffing. Um, some some uh, changes seem to be uh, direct and health related, but very, very few. Am I, would that be an accurate assessment? Or maybe I'll even put it this way, Jared. Were you surprised as I was that there weren't uh, fewer dramatic shifts necessary? Well, we made quite a few, believe it or not. They're kind of, if you looked at the line items, almost every line item was changed, give or take. Um, I think that, so the biggest COVID related expenses in this budget, there's three things. The staff, um, there's, um, I just had it in my head. Uh, there's some PPE related items, but that's really going to now come from uh, the grant that we're getting. And the other big thing was just the software. Um, other than that, am I missing anything, Laurie? You know. No, I don't think so. Okay. Um, and, and you know what we really did is we also again, went through every line and said, is this something you absolutely need to have in FY21? And that was a discussion really, maintenance was a big one that we had as well as transportation. And then I know the principals had that with each, um, especially at the middle school and the high school with, with each department uh, head. And then Laurie and I had that additional conversation with each principal. Um, you brought up transportation. And I'm curious, how much do you think that number could vary uh, from now until we've got a better handle on how many kids are gonna try to be riding the bus? I think it all depends on the, the number of runs that we end up doing. I think once we get all the survey results back, um, we did budget somewhat conservatively. I pretty much level funded it. Uh, and I'm hoping that that will be more than enough. We can also use, you know, the grant as part of that uh, as well. Um, so I'm, I'm hesitant right now to, to give a number of what it would vary, but I think we have enough in our contingency that grant um, and, you know, hopefully there's going to be swings one way or the other. Maybe another area that we thought would cost us more uh, will potentially be less. We're just going to have to run reports daily and, and watch every number. 
I think really the elementary schools is the place that we've got the most to look at. The middle and high school, because of the hybrid model, we've already reduced capacity there so significantly that I don't think we're gonna need extra runs there. So the elementary school, because we're bringing all the kids in with buses that can't hold them all, is the spot we're gonna really need to watch. So the, so the region transportation, which is unchanged thus far, might stay that way, but uh, the CPS is a work in progress. So the region transportation um, reimbursement that makes up part of our budget, I do not think that's going to stay. I think they are going to reduce it. I reduced our amount by 125000 I'm hoping that's enough. Um, on the, we don't get any reimbursement at the CPS side. It's all general fund expended. Yeah, I was referring to the cost side. Oh. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, I mean, Court, I haven't given up some hope that we're gonna be able to do it fairly cost neutrally, but we just don't have that data yet to no, know. That's, that's, yeah, the, that's fine. I don't, don't, don't consider it the criticism. I'm, no, I wasn't, I was just clarifying. <laughs> yeah, good, yeah. okay. But Chair, just uh, what's the, $125,000 percentage basis? Um, I did about 10, a little bit higher than that. Um, it was, the amount was originally budgeted at um, 675. So actually I did a little bit more. Um, and I, so originally I budgeted 675,000. It's now down to 550,000. Okay. Um, and what makes you think they're going to cut that? And when I look at it, I think about, you know, most of the regionals are not uh, where we are financially. Um, it seems to me the state would try to try to keep that number relatively stationary. I hope just based on past cuts that they did, you know, back in 2010, Circuit Breaker and um, Chapter 71 were cut. The thing is, though, and the, the really good thing, and that's going to actually help CPS as well, but is they budgeted for Circuit Breaker transportation reimbursement. That's going to be probably the first cut that they make. So the regular reimbursement will be less drastic. So if, if they weren't initially budget and I did not budget for the circuit breaker transportation reimbursement because that came out after we voted our budget. So if that's the first thing that they cut, that's going to make that number that we have, I think they'll, they'll reduce it less. Now, if they weren't doing this, or if I did budget for the circuit breaker reimbursement transportation, I probably would have reduced it maybe by 200,000, give or take. Uh, it's all just a guessing game, but I also feel with Chapter 71, even if it's 50 or 100,000, I think we can make that up in other revenues. And speaking of makeup, Jared, just back to your question about um, primary COVID-related COVID changes, the PPE software and staff are primarily increases, uh, increased needs to offset for that, I know I noticed a lot of cuts in supplies and materials, which makes sense, the supplies and materials that we won't need as much. Um, but can you just give us that quick summary on that side too? What are the, the primary three offsets that accounted, that kind of balanced out the new needs? Oh, sure. Um, it was, and I have it right here. If that is easy to pull out, I don't know. No, if it, it is. is. It is. Um, so, well, supplies and materials were, were pretty much one of the biggest offsets. And right. then the others were um, at CPS. Of course, my computer's slow. Um, the main offsets were, um, so contract services okay. uh, was a big one. Uh, equipment, uh, mostly in maintenance, was quite big. The field trips, that was also an offset. Uh, professional development. That was a $93,000 offset. Um, so the, and then the substitutes. Substitute reductions were 100, 173. 
Yeah. So at CPS, um, there was about $617,000 worth of cost savings. Um, and then at the high school, it was pretty much sort of the same. It was substitutes. It was field trips. Um, and special ed tuitions was the big one. If you remember, um, yeah. we reduced special ed tuitions um, 514000 because that's what the numbers were, were saying. Yeah, uh, which is, That's which is great. and you did tell us all of this in your last presentation and slides, but it's just helpful to go through it again sure. yep. as we've digested this. So, other questions for Jared? So, Jared, um, just a reflection. I do think what will come up tomorrow is uh, in the ten twenty that we've left in the four hundred nine for computer hardware at the region. So um, I think we'll have to have further discussion on that, in my opinion. Um, and I just want to say we, we will. <laughs> right. No, that was the intent. It's there by design. So you can discuss it um, because the question is, do you want to reduce it now? Do you want to use it to prepay in the spring? So next year's budget might have more wiggle room. It was left so you could yeah. purposely discuss it. The, the other one too, because I wanted to give you all options. Mm -hmm. um, was uh, at the high school was also the prepaid special ed tuitions. And then at CPS was the carryover in circuit breaker, which I did not expect to have last December. So that is something that could potentially lower the CPS budget if you so choose. Okay. And again, all intentionally left in to give you all options. Uh, should we move on to uh, CPS? Or do, you, do we need to do that? We do need to talk about the, just to follow up on the technology, but not until we've finished any other budget questions. Any other questions? Okay. Um, <coughs> should we move on? Did have we want to talk about the IT? What's that? I'm sorry, did we want to talk about? Yes, we need to talk about technology at oh, CPS before we Right, move. so on to, on to the CPS that's budget. Right. Um, right. No, that's quite all right. It's hard to tell where we are sometimes. Um, I, I would, I, and I'm moving around on my screen to, to view the different documents too. Um, so on to the CPS budget. And with apologize, apologies to our Carlisle friends, we're gonna to try to go through this quickly, but are there any first initial questions on the CPS budget? And then we will discuss the technology question. Again, I'll hold for Wednesday. Okay. Okay. All right, sounds good. Then Laura, do you wanna give us an up, is there more of an update or an overview slash update of where we were last in our discussion on yeah, technology? A, a little bit of both on this topic. And Peter Kelly can, he's here somewhere, I think. So if he can join me, there he comes. Um, there we you. did follow up uh, based on our conversation Thursday about the different options to um, be able to achieve one-to-one -one at K-5. And as you'll remember, we uh, brought you thoughts on a few options, which turned into one more option, uh, Chromebooks, laptop, Apple laptops, and then Cynthia smartly said we should give iPads some consideration too. So we've been doing that work as best we could in that short time frame. Um, I guess I'll just give high level views of where we are at. And again, it's not really a vote, but we don't want to make this decision without you being part of it. So Chromebooks are proving to feel less like the best option. Um, we continue to talk to districts that struggle with them and they aren't lasting. We also know there's a significant back order time factor right now um, to the point where the commissioner and governor are getting involved as of today. So that's one piece of the concern. And obviously the bigger concern there is that we've been a district committed to the Apple products and done very well by them, at least a court, at least in Peter and I's opinion. Um, we're getting a long, long life out of them and 
feel really comfortable that we're serving our educational priorities and students reliably. And um, I think over time, there is some cost, not neutrality or um, benefit, but certainly efficiency that we're able to get six and eight years out of machines that I don't think we do that with other, other um, providers. So that led us then to the iPad and I and laptop discussion, which we've had sort of virtually here all weekend long. Um, Peter did get some numbers, albeit a little less tidied up than we would have hoped from what we got last week, but it looks like uh, there could be cost savings there, but we then also had reached out to our technology specialists who really are the front line out in the schools. And the vision had been towards one machine, one device to support. Um, they really, probably more strongly than I expected, felt that the laptops provided options for even the younger kids. So um, I guess the final piece that I'll just share in terms of direction of thought, our, our replacement cycle, and I know we talked on this briefly, our replacement cycle at K-5 is the only one that isn't up to date. We worked really hard the last three years to get both the high school and middle school online and process-wise, a five-year solid financed replacement cycle that we now got built in to the budgets. K-5 has been the one that has uh, taken the shorthand to make that happen over an extended period of time. So that goal, um, that goal won't change no matter what decision we make here. It does seem like the laptop decision option gives us a way to not only fix the crisis need for devices, but also address the five-year cycle and actually come out in a better place. Um, I know I heard, understand Cynthia's concern with the lease being the way to accomplish that. It does sit within the budgeted lines. Um, and I, I think the concern going forward is valid and one we should talk on more. I think the reason we're staying with that recommendation is because of the needs in the schools, we'd have to supply that. We, I don't know that we'd be able to cut those lines um, and still have functioning, functioning tools for kids because a, a good number are gonna have to come offline and this purchase would allow us to start doing that rather than waiting till it's really a ban, you know, a, a challenged approach with Chromebooks in the mix too, or, or iPads, which wasn't the plan initially. So that's, I don't know, Peter, do you want to add to that? And then we'll just open it up for discussion. Yeah, no, I think that's well said. I think the other concern as we walk this subject backward was getting back to the curriculum and what is K-5. Mm -hmm. And once we're through this crisis point, K-5 is not a one-to-one -one environment. At least that's right. where we're at now. So if we were to backfill some of what we were talking about with iPads, we're gonna run, well, what's gonna happen is we're gonna have a lot of assets that won't get used once we get to the other side and, and instructions back to its daily norms. And with 80%, pretty much 80% of the, of the fleet in the elementary schools, well past the five-year replacement cycle, that's a, it's a large hole to find ourselves, find our way out of. And while I agree with Cynthia, I would not look to a four-year finance agreement under normal circumstances. I think the fact that it falls within our existing budget line for the next four years, it allows us to play a quick game of catch up with devices. The iPads that are in the elementaries can be moved on to the preschool, which is another bonus that we hadn't really discussed last week. Um, when you put that all together, I think we wanna make this decision, not just based on what's happening now in the middle of this crisis, but you know, as we come out of it the next two, three, four years, we still have the same inventory issues potentially, and we still have the same hole to come out of. This is an opportunity that, that solves a lot of issues for us. So what would be the, so just play, so I would support this purchase if after we get through this, that the, so what are the K through three, let's say students gonna have to use after this? Because I would support moving these devices to six through eight or five through eight or something like that. It's, it's actually somewhat the reverse right now. So we're trying to put the numbers together to, to supply what we need for the elementaries. We just were able to put the purchase order in for the middle school laptops that are coming in for FY21. When we get the rising eighth graders laptops back, 
uh, they'll pick up their high school laptop sometime this month. That eighth grade um, batch of laptops, depending on, we have to go through which ones are usable. We wanna bring those down to elementary level. When we do that, we get three grades now that are one-to-one -one with existing assets. And now you're backfilling from K to three. Uh, so we're shrinking that number that we've got to supply uh, and purchase. So it's a smaller lease? I'm well, no, it's the same lease. But you, so to your point, going forward, when we come out the other side, right. the opportunity with the new assets that we have is to move on from some of the really aged laptops that we have, six, seven, eight years, um, and get those out of the system and recycled. And that will put us back on track with the elementary schools, they'll still function in a, in a two to one environment. We won't be trying to maintain that one to one asset level anymore because that's not what the elementaries are. So, so what I'm trying to say, will a budget line item in FY22 be reduced assuming that we are back to normal school? I think if you take the four year lease, you're gonna use that existing budget line, the 60,000 per year, and you get it per school, so it's 180. You're going to pay off that financed laptops that we're doing now over those four years. Once you come out of that and you're outside the lease, you're back really on the standard five-year replacement cycle, and that will allow us to move forward from there and keep things up to date. Right, but I'm saying the only way I can justify this is if I say, okay, the, the eighth grade, or excuse me, the sixth grade at the middle school is going to get these as we move them out of the elementary school. Well, I think the, one of our problems that we're, main, that we're trying to deal with is the fact that the elementary school is the one building where our laptop fleet is old, getting aged, and we're not able to retire them, the ones that we have in there, because we haven't been able to catch up. The middle school, I mean, thanks to Lori's work since she's been here, we've stabilized the high school, the middle school is stable, so they're running a one-to-one -one program, and we, have, we can maintain that annually very well. When you get back down to the elementary school, we are basically at a 10 year replacement cycle, we're behind. So this one purchase, which we get in advance, the assets, when we come out the other side of it, it's going to allow us to catch up and get uh, removed from the elementary school's devices that we should move on from. And we'll land pretty much in a better place, a little more on an even footing and going forward with that budget line staying the same, we're back on a five year replacement cycle. Can I jump in for a second and see if I'm understanding correctly? What you're saying, Peter, is let's say for a second that we don't do this. We get iPads or we get Chromebooks or something. Then, then when we come through this, let's say, whether it's a couple of years from now or whenever, we then find ourselves in a hole where we don't have enough laptops and we all of a sudden have to do a large bulk purchase of laptops to fill that hole at the elementary mm -hmm. school for the typical use. Is that correct? Correct. Okay. So in that case, so because Cynthia, I think what you're saying would be great if we could take these that we would be purchasing now and put them towards say the middle school where there's another need, that would be great. Except for the fact that my understanding is that we can't do that only because there's already a need at the elementary school that these will be fulfilling. Right, and I'm just saying this is way too big a number and I'll let other committee members speak but I just don't think this is responsible in the last, in looking forward to what could be terrible fiscal years, 22, 23, to lock in $175,000. That's just. I'm, I'm not gonna make the uh, discussion any easier by saying I worry about solving a district problem around uh, sequencing machines uh, toward different grades uh, when our immediate problem is to try to get a remote learning device into the hands of a first grader. Uh, I don't think we can satisfy both needs with one solution very well. And I didn't hear anything about the, the efficacy or the practicality of uh, a, uh, a MacBook in the hands of a first grader who's got a lot of adjustment already to do in a month's time. So I think if we don't look at the teaching and learning side of this, if we only look at the IT supply and IT support side of this, we might uh, be causing problems for kids in the near term. Yeah, I don't know that we're articulating it well, but these recommendations are coming from our educational technology 
people in the buildings who are supporting the grade levels. So I, I don't have a presentation for you given the timeline and all the, the, well, the, the turnaround here, but I, I don't wanna not say that. I'm far from an expert, but I just, I don't believe that laptops are commonplace in early elementary. And I imagine there's a reason for that. But I think well, if, you just if, if that's that the advice we're being given, I think we need to at least listen to it. So you're, Laura, you're saying it's the technology specialists at the elementary schools who are saying these would be better than the iPads, even in first and second grade? So I'll just, I'll read what I have from one of them over the weekend. Um, iPads have not proven to be a good investment. They have a short lifespan and have costly complications such as app purchases, protective accessories and requiring unique management and repairs. So we do have kids, you know, we have little kids on desktops which are not completely foreign to them, the keyboard and all of that. So I, I wasn't prepared to pitch you all the educational pieces but that's at least the high level. Well, Chromebooks I, are I also going to be a keyboard and web-based environment, so that would be the co least costly option with some of those issues too, I think. Go ahead, Corey, I didn't mean to cut you well, off. Well, no, I'm just, I'm sorry that this is as difficult as it is because we have two problems here, uh, but we do have an immediate one that uh, is going to need to be satisfied for a year or two, and that is... Uh, uh, getting young kids functional in a remote environment very, very quickly. Um, and, and, and yet we have this other, other problem of the K-5 or K-8 computer cycling uh, program. Um, so I would hope that we could step back and maybe it'll uh, prove to be you know, completely unworkable financially, but look at what a quote unquote proper solution would be for, uh, for the program. And secondly, a proper solution for uh, K2 so they can go remote. And let's see how bad that is. Let's see uh, what, what kind of nut that is we have to crack um, if we were to do this quote unquote, you know, right. Can I so ask you, you've cobbled together two problems and one solution. Is what I'm is what I'm hearing so far. I don't think I understand that. I got. I thought we just heard that the technology specialists are okay with the idea of MacBooks. Yeah, and the support I heard was that they're easier to manage and maintain for the IT specialists. I've heard nothing about kids, other than yeah, some of them are familiar with a keyboard. I well, and I'm going to ask some forgiveness on that. I've had two days here to present yeah, this. Yeah, I'm not trying to attack you, but yeah, you know, we're, we're all under the gun together trying to make sound decisions. But I guess I, I feel like I, we maybe missed a step here. The, the 60,000 at each school, if we weren't in a mode of trying to scramble to get to a one-to-one -one envi one -one environment, the plan was to buy laptops with that 60,000. Yes, pay them straight out, not a lease and start to replenish this K-5 fleet to the best of our ability within that 180,000. I think you could still do that. Peter, do you know how many devices that would be? We'd have to though get to a place where we ask families what the level of need is rather than the approach of distributing them. It would be more akin to what we were doing in the spring than I think what we were trying to suggest now. Um, iPads, even with the cost reduction, would still leave you in that place because with the 180, you can't afford more than, they were about $359 a piece. So it would still leave you unable to fund a product for every child. The only way to fill in would be to use the Chromebook option for three out of the sixth grade levels. You get 185 with a straight purchase in the budget line this year. You get 185 uh, devices. Yeah. So. <laughs> Pre-COVID, pre that's what we would have done. Okay. And start to build a cycle in of s pulling out the really old ones. We've got 80% of them over five years old in the elementary school. So that's the phase approach we would have had pre-COVID when we built the budget. So Lori, have we sent out the transportation survey yet? No, we have not. So would it be unacceptable to survey the K-5 families to ask them who needs a device? 
I'm open to that conversation. I will say part of what brought me to bring this to you when I did was conversations with the state about ensuring all kids had devices. So I, I didn't, I, I, I'm, I'm struggling with what that means exactly at the low grades where we aren't one-to-one. -one. I'm just trying to, I, I, I'm not, not necessarily opposed to getting the kids, to, you know, getting our students devices, but it's just the number is very high. And I'm just concerned about, you know, once we enter a lease, it's not something we can decide, well, we'll just cut this 175. I mean, we've made a commitment to a four-year lease. So if, if there's any way we could get that number down to you know, something around the $100,000 mark, either through families opting out or... Peter, how many devices was the 100,000? We did run that. We did run that, yeah, one second. I think, I guess, I, maybe this is the part we haven't said very clearly either. Because we're behind on the replacement cycle, even in a tight FY22, we're gonna be really struggling to go there because we have so many aged machines that we're gonna to have to keep that somewhat funded or we're gonna, even in a normal time, find we don't have working devices for the K-5 kids. Mm -hmm. Maybe that's the part we didn't state very clearly is in our heads, that's gotta stay fairly stable or we're gonna get really, really behind. and very soon, you know, not be as operable as we should be. You're at about 415 devices with 100,000 on lease purchasing power. Okay. Versus how many at 175? We were at 725. This is sounding very much like our conversations way back when we were <clears throat> going one-to-one -one at the high school. Mm -hmm. um, and what I'm fearful of with this idea of, um, asking who can use their own device is we are entering a period of time where our ability to deliver education of these kids may absolutely depend on the devices they have in hand and our ability to maintain those um, is all is going to have to be done remotely versus coming in and you know with some clunker that got handed down from dad who used it for five years. Um, and that's a burden that will be hard on the IT staff, if not impossible to remedy. Um, and uh, I just don't, when I look at the size of the budget and I look at what we're using these devices for, I just don't think this is where we need to be trying to save 75 grand. Um, these are numbers we're going to have to spend given the, the direction we've taken using technology in our programs. Um, and, uh, you know, to me, it's like saying you're not going to buy books. And uh, I just, I, I really think we are, uh, I think we've got a, a good situation uh, financially to address a meaningful issue we've got right now and are going to have in, in four weeks. So, you know, we don't have all, you know, these kids need these things first week of September or the second week of September. So we can't spend two weeks trying to figure this out if we're going to put those in their hands. Um, and I just, I really, I think we're overthinking the cost of this. Uh, so this year we're in a good financial position, but next year we could be in a terrible financial Absolutely, position. Absolutely, I know. But, but so you're saying we're in a good financial position this year? No, I'm not saying we're in a good financial position. I'm saying we are in a good position to be able to address an immediate need and fulfill a longer term need that we know we're going to have. And if we don't keep that up, we are going to be in between a rock and a hard space. And we've been there very recently with this stuff. And we've, we've been pretty good at working our way toward cleaning it up. And I, I think this is an area that, you know, we really need to be consistent <clears throat> in maintaining our resources because we have put a lot of stock in our ability to do, uh, to do computer-based learning. Um, so I just, I really don't, I mean, 
you know, been down this road with buses too, but if you need to save 75 grand, don't buy two buses. I mean, this is not where to skimp in my mind. I don't know how I long we, we're I think we need to, to take do of the, of the jeopardy that uh, we're gonna encounter. But if from a teaching and learning point of view, it's necessary, the clock is running pretty, pretty fast right now, to your point, Wally. Um, and, and the other thing to worry about is that Apple gets in a situation where they're backed up, not unlike Chromebooks. Um, this is, a, you know, supply chains are tough right now. And uh, striking while the iron's hot is usually the better way to go. Well, the, the superintendent has the authority to move within the budget um, uh, around a purchase like this. Um, I would simply uh, want to, to know that she's confident that from a, uh, a pedagogical perspective and a, a practical a utility perspective for a first grader, a laptop's going to work. And uh, if so, you, you won't hear any more opposition from me, but we'll, I'll continue to have the concern that uh, Cynthia raised, but we've got to make things work for kids in September. Yeah, I am confident. And I just say, you know, we, we're, we're back in the COVID position that we keep finding ourselves in of rushing to make choices that aren't good in either direction because we're rushing and there's implications that are not clear to us. And I totally appreciate that. So Right. Uh, I'll just weigh in quickly. I completely hear what Cynthia is saying about a lease and partially because that's always my first question. As soon as someone says lease, I say bad idea. I don't want to be in debt. I don't want to commit to something later on. So I completely get that argument. At the same time, right now, I fall on the other side of, I think, what A, what I've heard is this is the proposed solution that is ideal for all students. And this is what our superintendent is asking us to fund in order to enable the education for those students. And B, really to reiterate that, it, this, is, this is how we're learning now. I mean, we could be remote 90% of next year. And I consider this, this you know, essential supplies in order to enable the type of learning that we have to execute over the next year. So I feel strongly, even though I don't like leases in general, that this is an important way to do it now. The reason that I m mentioned before that it fills a hole later is not because I'm trying to solve that question of the hole later, but because it makes me more comfortable that we're not throwing away this money now. It's money we'd have to spend anyway. And these are laptops we'd have to spend anyway. So therefore I don't feel badly buying them all now to solve the problem of educating kids this year. That's it. That's where I am. So any other, I think we've, we've uh, four of us at least have jumped in. Um, what do you need from us tonight, Lori, in terms of decision or commitment? Or uh, yeah, I, th I think I got the feedback I needed and I hear the concerns. Um, we're going to make a thoughtful decision here that Fiscally, Mr. Stanton, you want to weigh in before we wrap this up? No, no, I just think that we got the 60,000 in each line. It makes sense. And we're just solving a problem that we're going to have in the future. Doing that. The goal was, I guess this will be my closing thought, and I, all the statements are valid. So that's, you know, that's, I'm not debating any of that. Um, maybe with the one that feeling like we can do educationally well by the little kids. But, uh, you know, I think the goal was to get, Peter and I have worked really hard with Jared and building a stable funding mechanism for the technology because it was very, very not stable in a lot of places three years ago. So I guess to put money into what I thought I was going to recommend, which was a Band-Aid of throwing a couple hundred thousand at Chromebooks just to fix the crisis, that would mean we need the money for the Apple replacements to really build the stable cycle we planned initially. This feels better than that if we're just at least relatively comparing tools and funding and processes. Um, this feels like at least we're 
getting ourselves on track for a longer term usefulness rather than a expensive band-aid to get by. So I'm with you. I don't like some of how this feels and the time pressure we're under. Um, but here we are, so. A promise to follow up and tell you where we are as it plays out so that we're sure and bring you that educational um, overview that I think we didn't have time to bring. We can certainly bring that to you as school opens and share more of the tools and what we're using them for. But that'd be great, that'd be very helpful. Okay, good. Um, we wanna move on to calendar? If we're good on that, yes. Carlisle members, I'm sorry we dragged you through that for so long. <laughs> Um, okay, so on to calendar. Is that where we are next? <coughs> Excuse me. Um, Lori, do you want to give us a high, an update of where we are there? Yeah, so this is uh, <coughs> nothing's different than when we met Thursday. This is your ability to actually vote a calendar. So we can just talk through a reminder of what the proposal is from the calendar committee. Um, we had relooked based on the commissioner's reduction from 180 to 170 days for students uh, with the, and the teachers still have 185. So those are your parameters that we were working with. Um, we are proposing that the 27th through the 3rd will be a um, prof be professional days for the staff as they return and we do all the training and protocols and processing needed as well as instructional discussions, department meetings, et cetera. Uh, we then looked at the eighth for a, a virtual day for students um, onboarding, but also certainly a day we can count as instructional per the commissioner's reminder to all of the superintendents earlier today remote has to hit that caliber, we certainly will accomplish that. The ninth, we would look to bring in K-5 in person. It, I'll remind you that we're proposing early release half days on all of the Wednesdays. So the committee felt that bringing 6-12 in on the Wednesday with a half day in the hybrid schedule the way it currently would look um, doesn't make a lot of sense. It made more sense to have a virtual half, virtual full day there, and then bring them in on Thursday to start the virtual rotation. So all then would come in on the tenth. Um, K twelve would then be in and operating in the ways we've described to you. Uh, we only looked at October in terms of a professional day on the thirteenth, attached to the long weekend. Uh, we had made a recommendation to retitle Columbus Day um, outside of the current federal title, but to the Indigenous Peoples Day language. We did not go past that because of so many unknowns. The committee will get back together as uh, we get into the early to mid part of September. We did expect that we could hold the school vacations as scheduled and commit to an end of school date no later than June 16th. And just a reminder, we're gonna keep clarifying this everywhere because I think we need to, that the early release half day would be scheduling parallel to the day before Thanksgiving. We seem to have mixed nomenclature there. So we're trying to clarify. It would be similar to that in terms of the in-person time. Um, students would then have uh, <coughs> academic work and opportunities um, in the second part of the day, mostly asynchronous. Um, may be synchronous at the elementary schools given the schedules the way they're coming out. But I think that's the recommendation. We can have any discussion. There is a vote on tonight if you're ready to vote for that. Um, we did have a fairly impassioned email around the transit of the switch of Columbus Day to Indigenous Peoples Day. Um, and having been around for other calendar issues. Um, I think I would recommend that the calendar committee put that off until we're back to a more normal structure where we have meetings and if people want to come to a school committee meeting and 
make comments about things they can. Um, I don't know if there's a, everything else we're doing right now, I don't know if there's a reason to rush on on that. It's Columbus Day is still a state holiday. In Massachusetts, um, personally, I'd be in favor of moving it to Indigenous Peoples Day, but uh, I don't know that in the middle of COVID is the time to do something like that. My so two cents. I agree with you, and I think it should be a town um, based decision. That's what's happened. I think five towns I looked Somerville, Cambridge. Um, so I would look to the town because the library should call it the same thing, and the town should call it the same thing, and then the schools, we could all agree that that's what we were doing. So, and the state did have a bill, and it's, it'll come back this year, I think. I don't know if it will be successful either, but uh, I, I think it should go to the select board as something that they would like to do. I, I believe it's wise to not make a change I uh, don't disagree with the two comments that have been made. My reasoning is a little bit different, and that is I, I'm reticent to have uh, uh, single decisions that relate to large uh, uh, conversations and decisions and perhaps uh, culture change uh, dictated uh, by our strategic plan and our cultural competency goals. I think... Uh, uh, decisions like this have to be part of a comprehensive plan that's really visible and discussed uh, uh, by the community and not uh, uh, happen again uh, in, in, in single small decisions over time uh, without an overarching plan. Uh, I go further to say I think it's probably time that we, uh, and I'll address this to the chairs, that we see that on about a monthly basis we uh, have a conversation or an update on our cultural competency initiatives, such as the desire of the community to have us pay attention to that. Um, so I hear all those arguments and I think it does make sense. Um, I wanna say personally that I would, I would be in support of switching it to Indigenous Peoples Day and I, have a little trouble taking a vote not to. Um, but at the same time, I think for all the reasons that you've said, it's probably only fair to make it a more broad conversation. Um, you know, my, my brain of always wanting some compromise wants to word it as Columbus Day, also known as Indigenous Peoples Day or something like that, but I'm not sure if that's realistic. Um, no, it's not gonna work. <laughs> but then we can make enemies of everybody. <laughs> you need to dig into that a little more before. You, uh, I thought that, you know, that was the first thing that came to my mind. But exactly. I don't, you know, I don't think they're going to exist on the same day. Um, so, given all of the given, given all of the dynamics around it, I will go with the the group recommendation to hold off on making the change because of the dynamics of change. Um, I suspect the vote we take today, which is probably much more important mm -hmm. for us on these highlighted items, um, the calendar committee, if they were going to continue to discuss this for some transition this year, would have to come back to us and get a fresh vote on that anyway, right? So, you know, you guys probably won't have much to do in late September, so <laughs> you can do that then. Once everybody's bored. <laughs> Um, um, in terms of the other things, I will just comment. Um, I know Lori said, if we're ready to vote, uh, my initial comment is that I think we need to be ready to vote because everybody needs to know what the plans are. Yeah. Um, and I am in favor of all of the other recommendations here. So would, but would take other questions or comments also. And I think I just, you know, the, the committee, <laughs> saw that as an opportunity to bring up the suggestion to change the name. I think everyone would understand that the pace we're on right now, the, the priority is to get the dates out to people and we can revisit. I'll speak for the teachers that were part of that conversation. I think no one hears you dismissing it. It's just a matter of the timing and the pace we're on for everything. So. Okay. And obviously those, those days would stick as far as when things started. 
But if we ended up having to go remote, they'd be remote beginnings rather than in person. Yes. Yeah. Okay. I just wanted to add that it is important to vote um, today uh, uh, on the calendar as families need to plan the quarantine time and vacation time uh, so people can be in, um, uh, in state um, and staying safe uh, before the school reopening. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Yeah, agreed. It's a good point. Um, sounds like we're mostly in agreement. Any other comments on the calendar before we move on from it? Well, thank you, thank you to the committee, and uh, sorry to say your work is not done. Yeah. <laughs> before we move to action items, um, I just wanted to check uh, and see that we've got somebody from the committee who's going to listen in on the uh, information session tomorrow at two for elementary parents and uh, the middle school parents Wednesday at seven and students Thursday at seven. I'll be at the two CMS sessions. Both of those? Mm -hmm. Okay, great. I'll be at the elementary for sure and the CMS as well. Excellent. So I th we're covered it. Obviously anybody else who wants to listen in is mm -hmm able to do that. Just wanted to make sure somebody would be there. Thanks for bringing it up, Lolly. And the two today were <laughs> very well conducted, very useful, and I'm sure the rest will be as well. So thanks to the people who are putting those together and uh, serving as the, the panel, so to speak. Agreed. Thank you. So uh, shall we move on to uh, Action items in the roadmap vote. Yes. So uh, we take a motion that the Concord and Concord Carlisle School Committees vote to approve reopening plan for 2021 school year as presented by Dr. Hunter. So we can move this, uh, but if we do, I'm going to ask for an amendment because we had discussions uh, whereby a couple of uh, minor, but in minor seeming changes, but I think important, uh, were going to be made, if I'm correct. Uh, yes. And uh, how do you want to do that? You want an amendment or do you want to uh, amend this motion before we launch it? You can probably move it to approve as amended in discussion. Thank you. Okay as presented by Dr. Hunter and uh, uh, amended. Yeah, so let's move it okay. and then we'll make an amendment to it. Mm -hmm. you, you can propose an amendment to it. Does that make sense? Either way. Okay, so I, I move that the Concord Concord Carlisle School Committees approve a vote to approve reopening plan for the 2020-2021 school year as presented by Dr. Hunter. And it, for that's both. for both committees. So we need a second for both, committees, for both also. committees. Second for both. Thank you. Thank you. Um, somebody care to amend my motion? Yes, I thought you might. <laughs> <laughs> court one and court two. <laughs> I, I, I propose that the uh, motion be amended to uh, encompass uh, the fact that uh, we had a discussion and uh, uh, a couple of wording changes were uh, proposed uh, to Dr. Hunter and the committee and were, uh, were uh, understood and accepted by Dr. Hunter as being uh, sensible. And is that for both committees? That's for both committees. And do we have a second for both committees? Cynthia, your lips were moving, but you're muted. Second for both. Okay, thank, thank you. you. Uh, okay, so any discussion on court's amendment? Okay. I was sleeping, I guess. What's the change? The change is that uh, as presented by Dr. Hunter, Aaron can clean this up if necessary, but as presented by Dr. Hunter uh, uh, with amendments reflecting school committee conversation. 
Oh, I see. It's, okay. Not even yeah. amendments. I'm sorry. An amendment to the with uh, to the plans. So we're amending our approval of the plan subject to the discussion earlier in the meeting. Thank you. Yeah. For the okay. All we need is subject to the discussion, and that'll I think uh, protect it because we know exactly we know exactly through the tape uh, what slides we were referring to and so on. Yeah, I think we can. Uh, that was. Uh, in item 6A of the uh, August 3rd meeting. So maybe we should just put that in the language. Okay. Be, uh, so uh, I'm not awake enough to clean it up and give it back to you. Uh, okay. Um, <laughs> but uh, take a revised motion <coughs> um, based on the amendment that the Concord, Concord Carlisle School Committees vote to approve the reopening plan uh, with alterations based on committee discussion August 3rd, 2020 of uh, meeting section 6A um, for the 2021 school year as presented by Dr. Hunter. Well, Given the fact that I didn't get a second on my amendment, did I? Um, I thought I seconded. Okay. Yes. So, so we need some protocol. I've got to withdraw mine and we've got to clean this up. I'm sorry. Well, if we make the amendment, how about that? How about. <laughs> oh, God. Let's make this really hard. The, uh... I'm going to withdraw my amendment and ask you to take another shot at it. Uh, Mr. Okay, would you withdraw your motion? To begin with, uh, first I'll withdraw, I'll withdraw my. Yeah, I thought that's where we we're going the first yeah. time. Okay, I'm going to withdraw my motion as well. So let's take it from the top. There we go. So I will repeat the. Uh, uh, can we have a motion that the Conquer Car Conquer Carlisle School Committees will vote to approve the reopening plan uh, as amended by discussion of the August 3rd, 2020 Joint School Committee meeting, Section 6A. Um, for the 2021 school year. So moved for both. Cynthia. Second for both. You, okay, you. you are muted. Thank you. Could tell you said something. Do we have any discussion on this? We had quite a bit earlier. Um, That's why we need chairs. Thank you. <laughs> so I just want to say that um, I'm prepared to vote uh, for the plan. I think it's, there's been a lot of work done, obviously, been a little bit part of that. But I have to say the more and more I think about our teachers in the building all day teaching in their classroom, I am very concerned for all the students and the teachers and our community. So I think we have to be, keep careful, watch, um, and be sure we're doing the right thing. And to that point, uh, Cynthia, I, I appreciate that as well. I think that's why uh, that heading on that one slide doesn't call out uh, return to school buildings uh, uh, and in-person learning as the, the dominant planning effort going on right now. Uh, there's also a equally uh, important remote learning and remote teaching plan that's uh, being put together of necessity. I uh, can't disagree with either of you. And I do think uh, <clears throat> one of the things we need to be doing between now and the end of the month is coming up with uh, some language around, uh, mm -hmm. if not what's gonna trigger some sort of building exodus or decision not to go in, at least something that's gonna trigger the conversation. Um, and I know that that discussion appears to be going on at the state level. Um, uh, I think it would behoove us to uh, to give them time to talk that issue through. Um, but I, I do, I would very much like to have something that we're being guided by if the state doesn't give it to us mm -hmm. before we uh, make our final decisions on this um, that we've put together with the knowledgeable people in 
our purview and uh, town staff and uh, whoever else Dr. Hunter feels it's important to have involved in that discussion. Um, and I, uh, you know, I look at this, I look at what we're voting on is what we're sending to the state to say, you know, we've done our homework on, uh, on what you've asked us to do. Um, and, uh, you know, left behind after the vote is our understanding that uh, we are working and have much work to do between now and the end of the month. I think that, that some of the stuff that we deal with in policy might be relevant to this. And I would really encourage us to look seriously at policies regarding wearing and keeping on masks and what it means, you know, below the nose, above the nose, all of that kind of stuff policies about masks on buses um, and what are the ramifications, like what's a consequence for not doing it? Because I think that that's something that's really gonna make a difference in terms of people feeling like um, there's, um, that there's something that we're all following, you know, that we're all uh, mm -hmm. conscientious. To that end, Lori, you had mentioned, I think, in a previous meeting that there were um, sort of COVID handbooks that would be made available to parents and teachers. And I don't know what the timelines on getting those out into the parent, um, into the hands of parents and teachers and students. But to Sarah's point, like if we had very specific, like you said, consequences for different things or even workflow, like... Mm -hmm. You know, what happened? What do you do when your child has a runny nose? What do you do when your child has a fever? All of those kinds of workflows that are like very clearly communicated to the entire community, I think could also answer some of those questions that where people are just feeling like things are a little bit gray right now. And I don't know what, if you have a deadline for that, but if it's any way that it could come out sometime in August. Yeah. The so that's the work of the building-based task force right now is to build those handbooks specific to each site. Some of it's obviously common. So like illness protocol, we, we have that already. Um, the mask discussion is probably gonna vary developmentally and looking at how we approach that. Um, but we're certainly having that discussion and uh, all of that will then be followed with the, the handbook will go first and then very quickly followed with the parent and student contracts that really are meant to be the highlights of the handbook brought to another level of attention. And we're already strategizing that it be delivered in a way that forces people's attention, not just a document that people sign off without reading because we know that's just too easy. So um, all of that will be late, late August, probably given the pace the building based work is happening. Um, but I think we can probably bring you previews of some of it along the way for sure. Well, thanks. I have, I have another question about um, about reporting because it's my understanding that if somebody doesn't live in the town, so faculty, staff, or, or some who does not live in the town, those numbers don't necessarily that and test positive. The positive test doesn't get reported to the Concord or um, Health Authority. Um, so how? I guess. Um, how is the processing of that information handled? Sure, so I think there's twofold. One is that the public health nurse has explained to us that the public health nurses across the, they're regional. So the ours has four towns and depending on the size of the communities, you know, how many areas they cover. So they are talking amongst each other when they get noticed and they see that there's an overlap there. And then whether we like the answer or not, the second half of that is the self-disclosure piece. So I, I, at least there's an infrastructure now. Back in the spring, that didn't exist. So at least there's a place where things automatically do go to the officials, um, which feels better to me than what was happening back in February where, and March where that wasn't in place yet. So um, not perfect. I, we, all had, we all acknowledge that. Um, so has oh, Metco made any uh, appeal to the state to provide 
sponsoring towns or the information that might be delivered, I guess, mainly to Boston, right? Um, mm-hmm. To us. I don't, I, I can't say I've heard that from them. I'm not sure it would be within their jurisdiction to make that happen. Um, it's certainly a conversation we can start with them. I don't think they have access to the information. It's going through the public health channels. So Metco they, doesn't. No, so they could help us advocate yeah. with the city, though. And That's the, what I mean, that they, yeah. that they made yeah. an appeal. Yeah. yeah. To, because it would seem like if they made an appeal to, I guess, Department of Public Health in Boston. Yeah, the city-based version. And, uh, right? You know, and then we all made appeals behind them as members of METCO. Uh, yeah. You know, maybe that would get some legs. I, I can see that being... Uh, um, I'm fairly comfortable that teachers are gonna let us know that right. somebody in their household has tested positive if that's the case, certainly if they've tested positive. Um, I'm a little more concerned about, you know, no differently than I'd be concerned about the family telling us from Concord to Carlisle. Um, but we don't have any, we don't have any mechanism to, un- to know this away from self-reporting outside of Concord and Carlisle. Yeah, I'll talk, I'll talk to the METCO CEO tomorrow and bounce all this around. I'm sure we're not the only community having this conversation. Excuse me, Concord Carlisle has the same public nurse. So no, the, there's no uh, lack of reporting. Right. And just to clarify a point that Wally just made, uh, if, if a family member of a of teacher, staff, student, anybody who doesn't live who would have reported to the, the Concord Carlisle public nurse. We don't, we don't find, there's no, there's no protocol that mandates that we find out about that. It's only the first hand contact with a secondary contact is not within our purview, right? right. So any, uh, you know, just so we're all clear, if a teacher lives in another community and their child has COVID, we are not gonna get noticed of that. Our public health nurse would not, might get noticed of that if they're connecting across communities with the health nurses, but it's it really is a local notification. So, yep. Um, one of the things that, uh, and I kept meaning to bring this up over the last couple of weeks, Sarah bringing it up reminded me. Um, I would be in favor of more of fairly strict um, punishments, the word that comes to mind. It's probably the wrong word um, for a violation of our protocols in this area. Um, you know, I don't want to get us into a situation where <clears throat> we get a lawsuit, but uh, to the degree that we can be really forceful really quickly about violations of this, especially at uh, the middle school and the high school. Um, Because that, uh, if we aren't doing that right out of the gate, it can be real hard to reel back in. So I would certainly support very strict penalties for not adhering to the policies. That's That's how to keep kids and teachers in schools. Right. Yes. Yeah. That's what you want. If you want to be in, yeah. which we overwhelmingly are hearing, then you better follow the rules. So, and you know, I have high confidence that uh, the people are pretty prepared to make the accommodation for others, the sacrifice <laughs> necessary, the idea that they'll wear a mask for me and I'll wear a mask for them. But uh, but 100% compliance is not realistic, and so I, I support what uh, Sarah and, and Wally are, are, are saying, and the community will need to hear it after we develop it and make you know make it very clear and explicit, and then we'll have to communicate it. Yep. Agreed. And Lori, just going back to the cohorts, particularly at the high school. It seems to me that even trying to get schedules and an approach and have teachers sort of get themselves organized, if we spend any more time trying to do anything else, 
whether than your proposed cohort, that'll be time lost sure. in doing everything else. So I, th yeah. Yeah. I think we just, you know, it's, it's obviously not ideal, yeah. but it's really the only way that we can possibly get the kids back into a classroom. And as Wally said, you know, an opportunity to make a new friend. <laughs> um, so I, I just, I hope that um, we don't spend a lot of, a lot more time trying to figure out an alternate solution. Understood. Um, just, there's just so much work to be done as you, as you were well aware. Yeah. Um, just yep. trying to get things up and running, so. And, and maybe when we get to a more certain, I don't want to say a certain, but a more mm -hmm. certain place and a more rounded out, we can explore alternative ideas about how to bring students safely together on some kind of basis yeah. in some kind of, you know, yeah. safe way of, of accommodating that desire. Uh, any other discussion on our amended, well, no, not amended motion, on our motion? I am comfortable moving, uh, moving this, um, uh, this, this plan forward, as it is just a plan for now. Uh, there will be uh, a lot more planning as we go forward. There will be a lot more discussions. Um, I feel confident in all the work that has been completed so far. Uh, there have been so many groups um, involved and uh, so many feedback loops involved in this uh, uh, planning process. And what happens between now and September uh, is still a long way um, ahead of us. So um, we can plan for all, all of the uh, questions that will be arising and pa parents and students will be uh, bringing forward to, uh, uh, to us. Uh, just uh, quickly, uh, I, I've listened to the medical students um, uh, roundtable. There was some concern about maybe um, uh, giving some opportunities of students to uh, ride to school together, be on the same bus, and also to have a familiar uh, face um, in, in some of the classes. Is that something that we have any flexibility to, to do? Yes, we've been um, separately from the discussion that you're getting emails about, we've been looking at the METCO students and how they fall in the alphabet. And we may need to make a few tweaks there so that that feels appropriate. Thank you. Um, so if there's no further discussion among the members, I'm gonna make the brave assumption that uh, we are not the most popular meeting in town now and that's why we have 82 participants, but that what we're talking about is high interest. Um, so if it's okay with the committee, um, I would like to ask if anybody has comments from the uh, those people viewing uh, to raise a hand and uh, we'll take those uh, with the same rules we have for public comment early, which is, Usually three minutes, depending on the number of hands that went up, we might limit that to one, but uh, please raise your hand on the Zoom software if you care to make a comment. I'm scrolling, I don't see any. Pardon me? I said, I don't see any, do you? No. Oh, here we go, we do. We have one? We have one. Caitlin Smith, join us, please. Feel free to turn on your video and you can identify yourself for everyone. That would be great. Thank you. Um, my name is Caitlin Smith. I'm a teacher at Concord Carlisle High School. I've been a French teacher for 12 years there and I'm uh, also department chair of the World Language Department um, and have been for the last two years. And I would like to thank you all for your support and your giving us a chance to express ourselves. I haven't prepared any comments because I didn't realize that would be possible, but I just want to voice my own sentiments. Um, I wouldn't presume to speak on behalf of my colleagues, but I am deeply concerned about going back to school. And I think that 
the remote option is the safest. And while it has limitations, we've learned a lot from our spring. And there are lots of ways that we can deliver curriculum in a way that would be, I think, the most healthy for students and teachers in terms of our mental and physical health. Um, I'm really perplexed that we're being asked to return to schools when there is another option, given the great resources in our community. And I understand the many um, appeals from families and parents and students, especially wanting to get back to schools, but it must be understood that school will not be normal. It will not be the place that we know and love. Uh, it will be very difficult to hear each other, to breathe freely, to move around. And uh, I just fear for our well being on so many levels. And I worry about how the impact of people getting sick and truly risking death to come back to school. And uh, I know I'm not alone in feeling this way as an educator. I know that um, Dr. Hunter has been so compassionate and hardworking and thoughtful and uh, we feel her support. But this is very difficult. And if you find that it's not safe, I, I truly beg you to reconsider your current trajectory. And uh, I'm sorry, just consider the human beings that are gonna be in these schools every day because we have families and we love our students and we would like nothing better than to be there and love them and support them and teach them. But I think until it's safe, we need to do that from our homes. Thank you for listening. Thank you, Caitlin. Thank you so much for sharing that. Um, Kelly. Uh, Kirsten. Kirsten. Hi. Um, oh, I have to lower my, oh, I, it is lowered. Sorry. I, I'm just trying to get the zoom right here. Um, thank you um, for all, all of the um, hard work. I don't know if you can see me. It's kind of dark where I am here. That's better. Um, yeah, that's great. Kelly, if you could just um, introduce yourself for everyone. Oh, who sure. know you. yeah. um, um, I'm Kelly Kirstein. I'm a school adjustment counselor at the high school. And I've been um, at my post, um, loving every minute of it for 23 years. Um, I have a upcoming eighth grader um, who would be at Sanborn where I'd feel safe sending him. And I have a college upcoming sophomore who will be learning remotely um, for the semester, if not the year. Um, I was on the building task force. I know how hard everyone worked. I know how earnest the administrators have been um, I know how painful this is for the students and um, for myself, uh, I went to the round table. I saw some of you there. I literally got off and cried because I wanted so much to be with my students. But when I turned away back to my family and thought like, what if it's me? Like, what if I leave my own children? What if all the children that I love and all of you have to like, deal with the possibility that not only could I die, but I could become disabled. I might never be the same again. I might live and not be able to do the work that I love. And all of the assumptions that Desi made about why it was safe to go back have been proven to be false. Um, all of the so-called research that they put on um, their rationale for why we should be working on getting kids back was, has since then been completely dismantled. Every day on the news, we read about schools where the first day of school, a student tests positive, a, a teacher in Arizona working with two other teachers in a classroom who dies of COVID over the summer. Um, we, we read about kids in camp, um, granted they weren't masked, but in, in five days, 44% of them infected each other with COVID. And our, our commissioner is sending out research saying that kids don't get it and spread it. And that's being shared in the community and it's false. We don't know what this virus will do to us and we don't know who it will strike. It seems to be striking kids a lot more now than it was before. We know that our own children are finding it very difficult 
to hold to social um, distancing guidelines. Um, we know that the protocols will not protect us. If I am in a room where aerosolized particles can hang in the air for hours and a kid whose family member was exposed but they don't have to quarantine shows up and they're asymptomatically infected and no one knows about it and, and, and maybe their sibling was also asymptomatic, they're spreading COVID all over the place. Um, my, eighth, my upcoming eighth grader is on a baseball team in town um, with eighth, seventh, eighth, ninth and 10th graders. And he wears his mask studiously. And I have watched not only the kids, but the adults go to these games, they take their masks off, they don't follow the rules, they're shoulder to shoulder with each other. I love the children of Concord, they're good kids. The people of Concord are wonderful, but human nature is what it is. These kids are not gonna spend six and a half hours with their masks pulled up tightly over their noses, not breathing on us. And it's just inevitable that if you bring us back, one of us is gonna get sick, someone's gonna be disabled, someone's gonna die, and you're gonna have to try to live with that if that's what happens. I know we can teach remotely in a robust way. I've done it myself. I teach a grad class, I taught the Rutgers seminar. I deeply reached into people and I know my colleagues can do it. That's what we need to put our energy into. And yes, the children will be disappointed, but they'll be much more disappointed if one of us goes down or if one of their classmates goes down or if they bring it home to their grandmother and she goes down. And that's what we're asking you to consider. Desi never gave us any good advice. Desi did not give us any good research to work with and, and continues to, to propound things that we know are not true scientifically. I beg you to consider these things. Thank you. Thank you, Kelly. Let's see if any other hands up. Oh, there's one. Uh, Tamara. Am I there? I'm sorry, it just took me a minute to to get my uh, Zoom and take care of everything. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, my name is Tamara DeCesare. I'm a school counselor at Concord Carlisle High School. I have worked there since 1996. I'm the parent of a rising senior, so this is all, all, all too close to home in terms of the disappointment um, and how the kids are feeling. I also have a rising seventh grader who is slated to um, go to Sanborn. Um, I just want to echo the statements of my colleagues, and I think what you're seeing is the emotion that many of us are wearing. Um, you know, they say for teachers, August 1st is like the longest Sunday ever, um, you know, when thinking about going back to school, and this one in particular has been really, really hard, um, just anticipating um, the fall and what it's going to look like, and I appreciate, Court, your um, editing or suggestion around the reopening plan. Um, I really do appreciate the work that uh, colleagues, community members, school leaders have put into the task force because I have attended as many meetings as possible to learn about it. And I can say that, you know, I really do think that we feel the compassion and the caring. Um, and at the same time, I think maybe there's been some pressure to, um, to do what the kids want and or to follow Desi's guidance, which I agree with Kelly, I feel like is misled. And therefore I feel like the plan really has been mostly, at least the way I have read it, is to do a hybrid. And um, while remote is on that plan, I feel like there's not as much energy that's been put into it. And so now I feel like it's the time to really um, deeply consider um, moving in that direction. You know, splitting the alphabet in half, um, I, as a guidance counselor, I get it. Like, I see how that works. I had to explain to my own daughter as a senior why all the seniors couldn't be in the building at the same time, what the logistics are around classes and teachers and class sizes and social distancing and so forth. So I really do understand that. Um, but the piece that I want to, you know, so what that means is, like, if my daughter goes to school, she'll be in classes with maybe 12 to 14 students or less, I think a couple of her sections are smaller, but her teachers over the course of a week 
will be exposed to 90 to 100 students, the people who are older and more at risk. And I really think you need to think about that. Um, I agree that, you know, teens we're finding are able to contract this disease and spread it and so on and so forth. Um, but I also think we need to think about the, the proposed hybrid plan. I believe numbers wise, kids will be exposed unless depending on what happens, I don't know what the logistics are about lunch and free blocks and things of that nature in terms of where kids will go and who they will be interacting with. But if we just look at class sizes, they will be exposed to fewer numbers of people than their adult teachers will. And that has me greatly concerned. As a guidance counselor, I'm not really sure, you know, my office, you can't sit six feet away from me in my office. Um, and so there's been talk about maybe I'll be sitting in my office Zooming all day. I don't really know. Um, I'm really speaking on behalf of my concern about my teacher colleagues. Um, these are people I've worked with for decades and that I deeply, deeply care about. Um, I am, you know, also a resident of the town. I love this town. Um, and, but I just cannot impress upon all of you. I know you're voting for the overall plan that will be presented to the state. But I think much more serious conversation needs to be happening and planning and preparing kids and families that I feel like there are other towns that are saying remote is the way to go. And I too feel, you know, let somebody else take the risk. But, you know, and I'm, I, I don't even mean that. I don't think anybody should be taking the risk when it comes to life and death. Um, and, you know, I'm not trying to sound like chicken little, the sky is falling, but you cannot turn your news on and hear about the number of increased cases and Massachusetts now is asking for mandatory quarantines and we're heading kind of in that direction. And I read an article, yes, it was on social media about someone who's an epidemiologist and talking about even with social distancing, there's still going to be surges in this virus. And it doesn't mean that the social distancing isn't working, it just means that that's how the virus plays out. And so I just put that out there to you and I really thank you for um, letting us speak tonight, inviting us to share our comments. I do not envy your position at all. Um, and at the same time, I hope that you um, hear where we're coming from. We love our students. I love my job. I love the families and students I work with. I deeply, deeply do. And you know, I, I know that going back and physically in the building isn't gonna feel the same. I won't be able to give a hug to one of my students. I won't be able to have them in my office and sit shoulder to shoulder with them while we work on one of their college applications or have a group of my Boston students in together and having a conversation about whatever's going on for them, whatever it is, it's not gonna look like that anyway. So thank you very much for your time. Tamara, thanks. Steve Heyer. Hi, so it's actually Gail. I'm using my husband's phone. I have a third grader at Alcott. And I just wondered, is there any way, I know I feel for the, the families and the teachers and the students who are worried, you know, more so than others, you know, some of us have already had it and we've moved on and, and think that it's, I don't, know, I don't wanna get into personal stuff, but is there some way to give an option to teachers who want to teach and maybe some who would rather just do remote. And so maybe there are teachers who wanna go into the classroom and see the kids and let teachers who don't want to do that do something else because you know I've seen people moving out of town I've seen people moving to private schools and you know if the state thinks this can happen I think we should move forward so I'm, I'm really disappointed that I, it sounds like we're moving to giving up on in-person and I, I think that's a mistake and I, I wonder if there's some kind of option, you know, for teachers who, who, if they want to teach, they can teach. If they don't want to teach, they can teach from home. So that, that's all I, I wanted to say. Thank you. Thanks. Uh, let's see, no, there's a hand. Uh, Leanne? Hi, uh, Leanne Lanary. Um, I've been a resident of Concord for uh, over a little over three years, I have a daughter that's going to be going into first grade at the row. Um, I just want <clears throat> to echo, I, I know we've heard from a lot of educators on this about their worries about going back. And I, I totally appreciate 
um, all of the, the hard work and the thought that's gone into a hybrid model or an in-person model. And a lot of what people have been saying is, you know, the, the younger um, elementary school kids really need that social emotional boost of being back in person. Um, however, from my perspective, um, you know, what the, the first woman who said spoke is that it's not going to be the same. Everybody's going to be wearing masks. There's going to be no way to really see facial expressions. Those kids aren't going to be able to play together in the book corner. They're not going to be able to, you know, be in their groups doing art projects. It, it's for the, f you know, three hours that they're going to be able to be in person a day, um, distance from each other and not doing the things that they normally would have, is it worth the risk of the social, of the emotional um, detriment that could happen if their teachers and their, and their friends get sick um, and even die? So I, I know kids um, typically don't, um, you know, get very seriously ill, but they still can transmit it. And I've, you know, as people have said it, I was really hopeful last, last Monday when, when the, you know, plan came out to do a hybrid model or a, or an in-person model. But just in the last week, so many news stories have been coming out of Georgia and Illinois and all this um, about people going back to school and either it's shutting down right away because of positive cases or, uh, multiple people being infected. So um, I just, from a parent saying it, um, instead of an educator's perspective, I want to say that, you know, please try to take every, I, I know it's nearly impossible and I, I don't envy your position either, but please try to think of all aspects of this before making a decision. Um, because I think it's, you know, for people who, who think they want their kids to be back in and be with their friends it, it it's probably not going to be what they think it's going to be anyway and the model as it is now with the half days <clears throat> I mean for any families who have two working parents that's really hard in and of itself anyway so um, it's not like you know if you don't have help or after school care in place or anything like that it's not like those three hours in the morning are really going to help the work. Um, so that, that's, I just wanted to give my perspective and my opinion, but thank you all for doing all the work you've done and trying to make thoughtful plans for all of us. Appreciate it. Thank you, Leanne. Okay. Well, I don't see any more. Oh, whoops. I do see one more. Um, well, I think because, and, and we will certainly let this comment happen, um, we, we might want to start to say about a minute per comment because they're, because we've had a bunch and they're starting to come in more. Yeah. Um, we do want to hear what people have to say and then we, and then we will get to the vote after that. So Alyssa Begay, we'd certainly like to hear from you. If you can turn your, there we go. Um, I'll be Introduce quick. yourself. A lot of what I have to say, everyone, uh, a lot of people have already said. Um, Alyssa, Alyssa, can you give us uh, your name and oh, your yeah. street address? Oh, yeah. Alyssa Begay. Um, I'm at 93 Elmbrook Lane, and I've lived in Concord um, a little over 20 years, and I am a English teacher at the middle school, seventh grade. So um, rather than repeat what a lot of people have already said, I'd like to just talk about not just the emotional toll for adults in the building, but um, to recognize the stress and fear that the kids will also feel um, when we are in person, if we are in person, even in March, when things were just beginning and there were only six confirmed cases in Middlesex County, the kids were afraid. It was hard for them. And, um, I echo Tamara's concerns and um, Kelly's concerns that if something worse happens, a teacher, a grandmother, a student is ill, 
how difficult that's going to be on our kids. The kids that we're really concerned about their social emotional well-being is at the forefront of all of our minds. And in answer to, you know, about teachers wanting to be back, everybody wants to be back. Everybody wants to be teaching. There is, that's not a, there is no differentiation there. Everybody wants to be back and be back with kids. These are the weeks that teachers plan for the start of school. And it's really hard to do that right now. It's hard to do that not knowing. It's hard to do that knowing that plans could switch at any moment. And we want to create something for the kids of Concord that is powerful, important, and relevant for them right now. And I wish that um, we would consider committing to full remote so that we can do that and do that to the best of our ability. Thank Thanks, Alyssa. Appreciate the thoughts. Um, okay. I think, unless we have any more, I, I don't see any more hands now. So I think that concludes our comments mm -hmm. here. I think, whoops, sorry. I think we can go to a vote. Okay. Um, Clear. I just want to say before we vote that I, we all, I'm, I'm speaking for everybody, but I assume, at least myself, we appre appreciate very much your willingness to share your thoughts with us and some of them very difficult, I know. Um, and as was mentioned, we are voting on the roadmap, which doesn't tie us to one option in particular. Um, and we certainly have a lot, of, a lot to think about and, and we'll take all of your words to heart as we move forward. So thank you. I guess before we vote, um, just uh, I wanna give members a chance to say anything based on what we've just heard. Um, but again, as Heather said, we're voting on the, what we're sending to Desi. So, um, do a roll call. Uh, all in favor of the motion? Uh, we can't do it that way, can we? Um, uh, Rainey. Aye. Above? Yes. Booth. Aye for both. Bout. Aye for both committees. Wilson. Aye for region. Mustafi. You're muted. Eva, you're muted. Mustafi for region. Thank you, and Johnston, I for both. Okay. Um, I want to thank everybody for all of the work on that, uh, not just leading up to tonight, but the conversations we've had and the comments that were made by the public and the teachers. Um, So why don't we uh, move on? Uh, can we have a motion that the Concord, Concord Carlisle School Committees vote to approve the revised 2020-2021 calendar? Court. Uh, yeah, I uh, move that the Concord, Concord Carlisle School Committees vote to approve the revised 2020-21 calendar uh with the exception of the renaming that was proposed in the document presented to us tonight i don't think the renaming is being proposed in this calendar so i don't know if we need to make that adjustment. in the memo wally yeah but they didn't they didn't as you heard the superintendent okay that's fine as amended yeah are you seconding that? Is there a second for both committees? Both. Thank you. Um, any discussion? Well, I think let's say it again. Uh, we appreciate not only the work, but the uh, thoughtful work that looked at uh, the cultural significance of holiday naming and that uh, that's going to require some uh, really, really assertive uh, attention on the part of the school committee and uh, many others. So just uh, quickly, if we go remote, uh, we will not need to lose any days, correct? 
from uh, the prior discussion. It would, the calendar would stay the same as far as I'm concerned. Because professional, extra professional development and training would happen in those initial No matter days. what we do, it's only start like on we're not ready for without gotcha. additional days. Hmm. Okay. Okay. Um, Rainy. Aye for both. Booth. Aye for both. Out. Aye for both. Wilson. Aye for region. Mustafi. Mustafi, aye for region. Johnston, I for both. Um, a quick question, if I might, if it's appropriate. Yes. Might the Carlisle members give us uh, 60 seconds on their calendar planning, just so we know to the extent which we might or might not be synced up? Sure. Or do we not know yet? If you know. Sorry to put you on the spot, just curious. Could we, uh, could we do a, uh, a doodle poll? I was just, okay. Let me ask it this way. Has the Carlisle School Committee made any calendar decisions uh, sub, uh, recently? Uh, Sarah, do you remember if there was September 10th that we would be uh, opening, we're considering? Considering, I don't believe we have voted on have um, September 10th on so calendar changes. No official vote. Thank you. Uh, okay. So, uh, sorry, get my place back here. I have a motion that the Concord and Concord Carlisle School Committees vote to approve the retirement incentive plan. Um, so moved for both. Second for both. Any discussion on this? We do not want to hasten the retirements of any of our beloved teachers, but we want to give them the, uh, the, the options that are there due at this time. Good way to put it. Okay, Rainey. Aye for both. Thank you. Booth. Aye for both. Out. Aye for both. Wilson. Aye for region. Mustafi. Mustafi, aye for region. Johnston, aye for both. Thank you. And uh, this, Heather, you want to do this one? Wait, I was muted looking at the calendar. Also, I was just going to say, Laurie, thank you for bringing that up to us. Um, but yes, the last one is CPS. Uh, I'd be looking for a motion that the Concord School Committee votes to approve the CPS capital plan to include the following capital projects as noted on the document. Um, so we have discussed this before. Is there a motion first? I move the... Uh... You can say so moved, so, I read it. So moved. <laughs> Struggling for that so part. Do we have a second? <laughs> for both. Oh, second, okay, for the, second for Concord, sorry. <laughs> right, just for Concord. We're just Concord now. Uh, this vote is at least. Um, any further questions on this? We discussed it last time. Um, so we had made recommendations to yeah. eliminate the integrated playground at Thoreau and postpone the boiler exhaust. So it would be $70,000 less than the proposed 690 for a request of 620. That had been our discussion last time. Right, so, and that's, sorry, as we look at this now, is it adjusted to the six? 20? No, it's as it was because it's we hadn't it. actually voted or made a decision on that. So okay. I left it all there so you could see it still. Got it. Okay. So if we're going to, we may or may not approve it as is, we may edit it. And the recommendation was to take out the 70 and make it 620 as opposed to 690. Yep. 
Okay, so Which, comments and questions on that suggestion then, please. We were all pretty much in favor of that, weren't we? Mm -hmm. I think so. So correct me if I'm wrong, what started at 900 was 690 was now 620. Is that accurate? I'm sorry, I subtracted it from the wrong place. That's my fault. Yeah, it was 900, we're minusing 70. Yeah, right. so, so it's, it's 900 30. minus 70 is 830. Yeah. yeah, I grabbed the wrong number and subtracted. So, my so we're, looking, we're looking at the uh, accompanying uh, table dropping a 50 and a $20,000 yes. item from it. Bottom line that was 900 will be adjusted yeah. to uh, 830. Yes, thank you. Sorry about that. No problem. Okay, so any questions on that 830? And maybe we need the motion to be more clear that the number we're looking for includes- You want me to reread it? it? Yeah, could you? Thank you. Uh, make a motion that the Concord School Committee votes to approve the CPS capital plan to include the following capital projects, which are indicated in the attached document, totaling $830,000. Okay, so that is the motion reworded. Can I have a second for it reworded? Uh, I, I second it. Okay, thank you. So any further discussion on this or, or are we all in agreement? Well, I'd like the record to include, because it's not in that motion, that uh, it drops out the uh, $50,000 item and the $20,000 item. Doesn't have to be in the motion, but I'd like it in the minutes. Mm -hmm. Yep, absolutely. Okay, if no further comments, then by roll call, Johnston? Aye. Rainey? Aye. Booth? Aye. And about aye. So it passes unanimously. Thank you. And before we adjourn, I just want to make sure everybody has uh, the information for the executive session. Yes. Yes. Um, yes. Lori forwarded it earlier. Yes. Um, okay. Great, then we need a, let me get back to this. We need, we will need a motion that the Concord School Committee and Concord Carlisle Regional School Committee enter into executive session under purpose three of the open meeting law to discuss strategy with respect to collective bargaining or litigation. If an open meeting may have a detrimental effect on the bargaining or litigating position of the public body and not to return to open session. So moved for both. Second for both. Okay. Then by roll call. Oh, any discussion? By roll call, Rainey. Aye for both. Booth. Aye for both. Johnston. Aye for both. Wilson. Aye for region. Mustafi. Aye for region. Thank you. And doubt aye for both. Housekeeping. Thank you. What have we got? Three minutes, five minutes? Yeah. Let's three, say three uh, to five. Okay. Three to five, five minute break. We'll be. Thank you, everyone. Meet you in exec at five minutes. And Thanks. thank you, everyone, for being here. And everyone.